Well, by the sound of things, it sounds like I can't wait for the warm weather to arrive. And yeah, it couldn't arrive any sooner. Today was actually oh, so-so. A lot of rain, a lot of wind. So no flying for me. We went out and did a little shopping and got some things to continue working on our miniature projects that we do. And I actually was able to prepare a few videos during those rainy days, the last couple of days. And uh, I did post one. And I'll have to post another one tomorrow. And then I have another one prepared and yet another one that I'm going to be working on. So this week is going to have quite a bit of new content. And this is stuff that we already discussed. And basically, it just needs to be addressed a little bit more in detail. You know, the normal way that I handle things. A lot of details and maybe minimum 10 to 15 minutes each video. So that there are no doubts. When people watch one of these videos, I hope that it doesn't really raise more questions than, you know, it needs to. I should be able to address everything. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to immediately jump into DP Review Forum because, again, this just never, 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 ever ends. People wondering, how should they use their printers? See, what they want is to squeeze every every amount of or every drop of ink that they can out of that printer, but yet they really don't know how to do it, okay? They really don't know how to handle it. So basically what they're looking for is to have their cake and eat it too. My wife is making dinner for herself tonight. Um, anyway, so I don't know if you heard the microwave just go off. Uh, but anyway, um, it always, it, it's always this way. People buy a printer and they just want to, um, just use it as little as possible. And unfortunately they buy a, a Canon because of course you can get these Pro 100s, for instance, for almost a giveaway price, which is usually like 50, 60 at the most a hundred dollars maybe 99 dollars after rebates and then they go oh boy now i got a printer they don't realize that all that money that they saved because they should have paid like 400 dollars. ask the canadians and the uh, uk folks what they pay for a pro 100 and you will know so here's the deal they buy the printer they get it for say 50 dollars, and they also get free paper so basically they got the paper the paper for free. If you subtract the actual price of the paper from that $50 net price or $100 net price, you either got it for 50 or you got it for nothing when it comes to the net price for that particular printer. And now you want to you want to just let it sit there and not use it. So question was asked just today and I am not asking how to make a good print but rather, how often are you printing and what are you doing with your print? So this person is just asking, you know, trying to get some answers from people. And apparently he has seen all of my videos or some of them because somebody suggested that he do that. After he asked this, since this printer generates regular cleaning cycles and uses ink that doesn't go onto a print, how are you maximizing your use of the printer? And then another semi-related, but not really, question. How are you maximizing the life of your printer? That has nothing to do with the original question, but basically, I guess he's curious about the quality of the inks for the Pro 100. And I can tell you right off the bat that the Pro 100 dye ink set is probably the best that has ever been created as far as dye ink goes so there's no doubt that ink set is just fabulous but most of you and me and many others are going to immediately think about switching over to a third-party ink source and that will just throw longevity down the toilet i mean literally so i don't care what ink set you use it's simply not going to match original OEM inks and so you have 
several choices that you can do, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is going to be kind of a really interesting discussion, I hope, about the Pro 100 again. And why the Canon Pro 100? Because there are millions of them out there, literally. So Bob Petruska, who's really an expert with the R3000 from Epson. The guy is just, you know, a walking encyclopedia when it comes to that printer. He recommended one of my videos, and I don't know which one he recommended, and I'm not about to click on it to find out. The guy answered back, and he says that, yes, I have watched many of them, and that's where my question comes from. Uh oh See, that's not what I want to happen. I don't want my videos to raise more questions that they than they answer. I want you to watch the video, hopefully, and you get your answers to your questions. Mm. But... If you get a new question, by all means ask, because that might give you an idea for another video. And the content creation continues. That's how it works. The transition from thinking that cleaning cycles were scheduled based upon the last time you printed. See, that's the old thinking. And that was a mistake that all of us, all of us made. See, back in the days of the Canon Pro 9500 Mark II, a leaked service manual was spread throughout the internet along, you know, all of these different printing forums and, and, and groups. And there, it literally did say that. Whether it was misinterpreted by people or maybe miswritten, it came across pretty clear that, you know, you had 60, 120, 4, 240 and 480 hours windows of time and that if you printed anything before any one of those particular time windows was reached then the clock would reset back to zero so all you had to do was say clean it uh, print something like a nozzle check and that would prevent the next cleaning cycle from taking place well no no and no when canon pro 100 came out we all assumed that, including myself, I passed on that information. Many others did the same thing, and it ended up not being true, okay? So they went ahead and changed that. That's I mean, When I say they, I mean the Canon engineers. They changed that and switched it over to etched in stone, you know, time cleaning cycles. And so that no longer applies. So he realizes that now. Apparently he did watch my videos and uh, understood what I was saying. And he says, versus the newer understanding of regular cleaning cycles, regardless of when you last printed, changes the cost use ratio. I'm now thinking that turning off the printer and maybe even unplugging it, <laughs> and then once a month undergo a major cleaning cycle and print all of my prints from that month and then unplug it again might be the most cost cost effective way to go. You know what? You're wrong. Okay, you're wrong. Um, you can just not print for a month. Okay. See, remember, 480 hours is 20 days. So unplugging it will trigger the 480 hour, whether you do it, you know, just over one day or over two months is going to run that 480 hour um, cycle. It's just a, sl a larger cleaning cycle in volume. How much ink does it use? No one knows that. No one. It's very difficult to uh, figure that out by weighing the cartridges, for instance. There's no way to use the so-called accounting software on that printer because it doesn't uh, communicate with it. It's only for the, four, the Pro 1000 and up. So you can't really tell how much ink has been um, used in a cleaning cycle, purge cycle after a cartridge change, or during printing. You just cannot tell unless you physically weigh the cartridges. And that can only happen once because when you weigh the cartridges after previously weighing them, popping them back in, what happens? You run a purge cycle. Then you print some prints. Then you run a cleaning cycle scheduled by you know 60 hours or whatever and then you remove the cartridges again and you weigh them that included that purge that took place because every time you remove a cart and replace it back onto the printhead it's going to run another cleaning cycle or a purge cycle 
I shouldn't say cleaning cycle. These are just purge cycles. And these types of repriming of printheads occur only on printers that have cartridges that are right on top of the printhead. And that happens also on Epson printers as well, not just Canon. So don't get the wrong idea. All right, so what's the most effective way to go? Well, think about this. If you unplug it, that's an automatic 480 hour cycle, whether you wait a day, a week, a month, or four months, it doesn't really matter. That'll be the size of the next cleaning cycle that'll take place when you plug it back in. So how do you know that you're going to... Um, print something, say, in 10 days. Why not just leave it plugged in, and that way in 10 days when you continue to print, that's a 240-hour cycle. Smaller, you see? So unplugging it, especially off of the mains, is really the wrong the wrong thing to do. And I will not go ahead here and, and, and read what else has been suggested. Well, okay, I can't. I can't stand it. Maybe I will. I doubt unplugging it is needed, but if I do shut mine off since I don't use it that much. Okay, these people just don't get it. They're shutting off their Canon printers because they don't use it that much. Okay, here comes the rant. Then why the hell did you buy a printer? Really, why? Because you couldn't pass off the deal. The rebate was just too good. You know, it's silly. It really is silly. Um, unless you have so much dough in your wallet that you just don't care. And, well, I could afford it. I'll buy it and I'll keep it and I'll use it whenever I feel like using it. It really is silly. It's very wasteful and it's really the wrong, the wrong way to kind of get into this. Um, if you say, for instance, to me, well, you know, I got it because I occasionally print. And I just don't want to send my images out to be printed by someone else. You know, we'll just let, let, uh, you know, those labs, you know, just do work for other people. I want to have full control over my work. So that's why I have a printer at home. Someone's calling me. Who could it be? Uh, a telemarketer. I love this phone because it tells me whenever the bad callers are calling me. Anyway, okay, so. Yeah, unless you have a channel like mine where you need to have, you know, 10, 12, 13 printers so that you can then use them to answer questions and do demonstrations. Really, I mean, if you're going to just print once a month, guys and gals, don't get a printer. It's really not fair for the printer. And it's great for the uh, printer manufacturers and the companies that sell them. But really, it just makes no sense at all. Uh, if you're going to do that, then just look for a local place that will produce good prints for you uh, that you can have consistent results from. And just don't bother getting a home printer again unless you want full control. If that is the reason and you still are only going to print once a month, well, then having that full control, I suppose, is worth having the printer. And then, But be aware that you better not complain about, especially with Canon printers, about their cleaning cycles that are going to use up more ink dumping it into the internal pads than you will actually lay it on prints. Oh, you know what I found? My 1940s father's census and my family is here from Puerto Rico. And I also, I'm going to tell you later, this is hilarious. Stay tuned, folks, because you're going to love this. You assume your heritage is from a certain part of the world. You've been told this all your life. Your family came from this. Your family came from that. Until you spit on that little tube and you send it in for analysis. And then the real truth comes out. And I'm going to share that with you later on tonight. So, again, stay tuned for that. It's going to be awesome. It was just not long ago, I got the little notice that the results were posted. I went to Ancestry.com, and there it was, and I almost fell off my chair. So I will share that with you guys later. What a tease, right? 
All right, let me see just just what else was you know covered here. Mm, just it, it starts to deviate into other subject matters. Um, well, anyway, so yeah, and I think I discussed this the other week, and I'm going to be doing a video yet again on that because it seems to not sink in. Um, I was planning maybe creating a bar chart where I will actually show what happens. Maybe with a visual aid, you'll be able to get what it is that I'm trying to put into words. And this is why Canon does, doesn't even mention this anywhere. They don't mention this one iota about these cleaning cycles. They just want you, you know, to think it's just normal and they'll go unnoticed, but they do occur. And you know what my theory behind that was? I discussed that last week, or maybe I did it my little impromptu. Literally, it was three hours uh, on New Year's Day. And um, I talked about that. I'm going to do a video on that. And what I wish for you guys to do, I hope, is to, you know, just provide me with your two cents worth of theory, whether you think something else is going on. See, I was trying to come up with a reason why the heck do these cycles occur when I am printing more often than I would ever need to to keep that printer unclogged? In other words, the theory would be that you know if you don't use your printer, it's going to clog either because of environmental conditions, the ink dries up, or other other reasons. And so we must run these cleaning cycles, whether you like or like it or not, because we really don't trust your printing habits. Well, actually, I think it goes a lot deeper than that. I was trying to call Precision Colors, and I'm giving them a break right now because, you know, he's trying to catch up with work. But maybe, maybe tomorrow I will give him a call and discuss that with him. The idea about the Canon thermal printheads requiring to be flushed out, especially the more you print. Oh, wait a second. That makes no sense whatsoever. Well, yeah, I know. Stay tuned for that video. I'm going to do quite an extensive video on the subject. We'll discuss the possibilities and what happens, say, for instance, on an Epson printer, why they don't need to do this and why a Canon printer really has to do that for the printhead's survival. Simple. All right. So let's continue on. Let's see if there's anything else here worth mentioning. Then we'll head on over to uh, Facebook because, of course, that's always fun to look at. By the way, I said on a video that I haven't even, well, I guess I did put it out, where we almost had like 2,000 um, members. It's almost there. And today I just got another like 20 requests. So we're almost getting there, folks. Really, really great. Got to see who is in. I know that as soon as I popped out the chat so that I can see it on my screen, I immediately got a couple of people signing up. And it was like an hour before the so-called live stream began. Uh, see, we got a lot of questions here on the uh, that are, that are going to be really interesting to look at. And you guys are maybe, if I can come up with some good discussion on each one of these questions, I hope you guys profit from this information. Um, Cliff Medina, our good friend, 455, he was already on board here. And then at 520, Robert Smeltzer came on. We had then, soon after that, it's really like a competition, Stephen no Nowotarski from Michigan. Anthony Petit is here from Texas. Ross Photography, of course. And he asked if we were live. We sure are, folks. We sure are. Michael Bailey. Of course, Rob's Photography, uh, again, saying hello to everybody. And uh, Nash Hall for, from Port Stevens, Australia. And I don't think I, I, I have had you here yet. Nash, if you have, maybe you've been kind of just looking. Uh, Anthony Petit is saying hi to everybody here. He's been very, very social. That's wonderful. Uh, let's see, uh, Michael Bailey is saying hi to everyone, Andre Tocnorelli, 
and JTS Golf, JLS Golf from Laguna Beach is here. So we got a bunch of people that I have not uh, had here before. So that's wonderful to see all of these new people here. By the way, guys, I was floored that New Year's Day unannounced. I decided to do an earlier live stream. Four o'clock, I believe we started. And um, I had over 60-something people, almost like 69 at one point, people. So that's great. It's got to be a record, I believe. Michael Bailey says that the Pro 100 is $499 in Canada. So you see what I mean? So think about this. You get this beautiful beast of a printer for 100 bucks after rebate. The Pro 10, which I believe is one of the best printers out there, by the way, was being sold for a net $99.99. If you go... If you go directly to uh, the store and pick it up, again, no shipping charges. But again, they, they just charge you something like $69 shipping. So for $169, $70, you can get a Pro 10. That was during the Christmas month of December. And it was a special deal from, um, what was it? Murphy's Camera. And I don't know where they're located. But again, this happens pretty much every year. So... Imagine the money you saved. You could buy ink with that money. So, you know, what are we, I won't say you because that's not nice. What are we complaining about? We got the printer for, you know, a fraction of what it would cost. And now we're going to beef about inks? Come on. You know, you just saved a ton of money. Look what these people have to pay for in Canada and in the UK. It's crazy. Australia is you know, out of control as far as what they charge down there. We have John Babcock, Stig Steinsund from Norway is here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And uh, John Bank, John da, 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 Babcock is from Maine. We have WD Boston 1. Spike 597 from Madison, Wisconsin. And by the way, I did hear that. Remember what you sent me? Very interesting. We're going to get that figured out. What are we going to get figured out? Did I discuss that last week? I think I may have. Ralph Raphael Zaga, Zaga from Atlanta, Georgia. Steen addressing wow another guy from denmark uh marcus the Roos. again new guy i've never heard this name before reborn mcdougall george druin is here one of our regulars cliff medina from cuba are you in cuba wow michael bailey says unplugging a printer won't stop timers inside it yeah, remember, you guys, printers have an internal battery. That clock is tick-tocking, tick-tocking, tick-tocking by itself, okay? So pulling the plug does nothing. It makes things worse because it immediately, if you were under 120 hours on a Pro 100, now you're over 480. That's it. It just immediately uh, triggers that bigger cleaning cycle. Now, proportionally, from what I have seen, is the Pro 100 will not use proportionally total volume of ink, will not use as much as, say, maybe a Pro 10 or a Pro 1 for the same 60-hour, um, no, 120-hour for the Pro, Pro 100. So, say, a 120-hour cycle for the Pro 100, 120-hour cycle for the Pro 10, the Pro 1, the Pro 10 and the Pro 1 will be larger. Okay, it will be larger, total volume. Now, on the Pro 1, you could indeed check how much ink because you could remove those cartridges before, weigh them, record those weights in grams, and then wait till the next cleaning cycle and basically do the same thing, remove the cartridges and weigh them because putting them back into the printer does not trigger a purge cycle like it would on a on a 
printer that has cartridges on top of the printhead. Those need to be reprimed, but not the stationary card printers. Pro 1000, you can do the same thing very easily. So maybe I'm going to do that. Or with the Pro 1000, you really don't have to do that. You know why? Just weigh the waste ink cartridge before and after. And that will tell you the difference in weight. Whatever that difference in weight is, say between now and then I run a print, which will use maybe two milliliters of ink, and it triggers a cleaning cycle. And I know when the last cleaning cycle took place. That way I can I can figure out if it was a 60 hour, 120 and so forth. Then you just weigh the difference, figure out the difference in weight, and that should give you approximate how much, you know, M ml or milliliters of ink. A gram of ink doesn't necessarily equate to a milliliter, but it's close enough in this case. Uh, so that's one way to figure that out exactly, basically exactly. We have a Peter from Copenhagen, Stephen Nowotarski, now Nowotarski, yeah. Uh, heading to Old San Juan next week, next Saturday for a few days. <gasps> it's about the 15th time going there. Wow. Where do you live? Let me see. I think you said that earlier. That's where I was born, my friend. So, but anyway, okay. Well, that's I'm very jealous, of course. But I enjoy, of course, it's beautiful and very old, um, 1500s, you know. Okay, let's see. We have Aglio, Aglo, Aglo, Ara, daughter, oh man, from Iceland. Wow. John Bank Babcock Jr. I love my Pro 10, but did I make a mistake not getting the Pro 100? Okay, well, um, nothing wrong with either printer, believe me. Rebel Rebelson, Presente from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then uh, a bunch of uh, Israeli symbols. A, he says it's a newbie from Israel here. I can't read your name because it's in a different script, uh, but welcome anyway. Leonard Tech, hello everybody from Naples, Florida. We got Iglio Arandotir, again, boy, I can't pronounce any of these names. Loving my Pro 1000. Yeah, we all do. It's just that you have to get over, get over its idiosyncrasies and how it operates. I was just telling Michael Bailey today that I don't think the same timing uh, cycles or, or hourly timing cycles apply to that printer. There's just too much mystery behind that because there's such inconsistencies. When you're printing regularly, you know, you should be able to say, oh, okay, I just exceeded that 60 hour. That's why I did this. Oh no, it just does, it does whatever it pleases when it pleases, when it thinks it needs to do it. So. In that case, the Pro 1000 is probably more artificial intelligence type uh, system in there, or semi. Spike597 says, no, you kept it on the wraps last week. Okay, we're going to talk about that then. And you know what I'm talking about, because this is what you and I discuss. So we're going to go ahead and open up the floor, because this needs to be discussed, and it's nothing to do with that particular seller just just you know get that get that through your heads it has nothing to do with that particular seller anyone that's selling this will run into the same problem or or not okay or not because it could be a random thing douglas wilford was watching from London last week, but back home in Tennessee. Boy, you guys are travelers, I swear. Mole NZ from New Zealand. Uh, Iglio Arandotter, still watching for the dreadful clean cycles. Set the Pro 1000 up and haven't seen a cycle yet. Good, good, good. Um, 
you know, again, it's it's whenever it wants. And there's some settings that you can actually play with. And I'm going to do a very short video this coming week, I promise. This week is going to be fun because I will have time to do some videos. And uh, I have already several just waiting to be edited. So all I have to do is sit here and just edit them and put them out on a regular basis this, this week, the next few days. But I'm going to cover that. I'm going to show you guys what you need to do and what you need to disable in the LCD um, window of your Pro 1000 to reduce some of this. Let's reduce some of this. Although, again, should you do that? Uh, well, I did it, and so far, so good, so, but to be truthful with you guys, it's not something I recommend that you guys do, but I did it just experimentally to see what would happen, and nothing really bad has happened so far, so, I think it's okay. We have a Rudy Castillo, we had a John... Simpson from Canada, and we have Andres David from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Spike is asking Iglo, Iglo uh, what firmware he's using. Um, I'll tell you which one I have. I believe is the one before this one. I think it's actually 020. Maybe. You know what? If you guys give me like two seconds, I will go check. Yep, that's what I thought. I have 2020, okay? So, what does that mean? Supposedly, mine is older than the one that out that is out there now and the one that has been preloaded in a lot of the newer, slightly newer printers. Uh, so, what we're going to discuss next may have some bearing in this. And... Uh, let me finish up here, and then we can go ahead and uh, begin to talk about that. And again, I don't want you guys to run with this information because it's, all of it is still kind of unproven. So you guys need to uh, be careful with that. So let me see what else we got here. Someone has a Pro 10 over the holidays still in the box. That's wonderful. What's your favorite paper? Rudy Castillo says, well, I have many. My favorite paper is the one that when I look at, I love the look of it. Again, I cannot tell you which paper will provide you that feeling that you get because it's something personal to you and your tastes. What I would recommend, Rudy, is that you order some sample packs from maybe Red River, from Hannah Mule, from Canson, from Moab, Many of the providers or sellers of different brands of paper buy their sample packs and just simply use them on your printer. Try to print different images because certain images will work better on certain papers than others. And it's just, you know, it's just a fact. Something like a snowy uh, scene that's kind of cool in color, a little bit bluish uh, in the shadows and so forth. Uh, you need a, a paper that maybe is a cold a cold meaning that it doesn't have a warmth to it, maybe a nice cold matte paper or a burrito paper with a little bit of a gloss. Um, if you have a photograph of, say, a fighter jet at an air show, and that thing is nothing but metal and aluminum, aircraft aluminum, and all of this stuff, then maybe a nice glossy paper will work best. A picture of a baby... Rosy cheeks, you don't want to print that on a cold paper. You want to print that maybe on a textured uh, matte paper with a little bit of warmth to the paper base. You see what I'm saying? So things like that, images will work better on certain types of paper. 
And then you just have to basically look at them. Or if you have some close friends that are that you trust their opinion, prepare some prints and just have them come over for tea or coffee and sit down and go over your prints and see what they think, see what their preferences are. And you will be shocked how different they will be. They will not agree with you in most cases. But again, it's all about what you feel is best, not necessarily what others. But I think this little exercise will, will kind of show you, illustrate to you how we differ in our thinking, most people. Sometimes I show something to my wife and she says, oh, I don't like that. And I love it. So it happens. It just happens. So yeah, go ahead and do that. And that way it'll save you a lot of money because these sample packs are actually, if you really, really figure it out, cost per sheet, you're getting it for a lot less than you would if you buy, you know, a pack of 20 or a pack of 50. And you get to test all sorts of different surfaces and papers. Let's see. Michael Bailey sent me these the other day, and these are all different types of paper. This is a matte paper, another matte paper. You notice the, the uh, cool, cool blue color and a very colorful train passing by, which really contrasts with the overall almost, almost monochromatic bluish uh, background. This image and this image are identical, but this is a glossy or luster paper, and this is not. This is matte. So the, the look is different. You actually see the detail in the trees here. It's kind of almost lost here because this produces a much deeper black. And so you have to look at these types of images under very bright light conditions so that you can then see beyond that, that very, very deep, deep uh, D-Max that you get from these other papers. This is a, a metallic paper. But anyway, I showed you these last time, so... But I, just kind of illustrating the difference between paper surfaces and how they how they react with different types of images. So something very subtle, like a high key shot, like the snow scene. That's high key. It's mostly you know lighter colors on the on the uh, histogram. You look at the histogram; everything's pushed over to the right. So mostly from the middle up to the whites, and so a nice subtle neutral matte paper will work great from you know with an image that is not warm in other words it's not a sunset uh so yeah let's see what else we got okay so i think they were discussing the firmware so yeah i have the two zero two zero most people have the two zero six zero and i know um michael bailey is that the one you had as well right i think you told me uh Stuart edwards is loving his pro 100 works great with precision colors inks after watching your videos adam barr says just got my pro 100 had a very hard time installing the drivers but it happened in the end and uh let's see and now starting to get some nice results use your videos a lot to make sense of it all all righty um for me with windows 10 it's just so easy to install these printers i did a, a, a windows 10 you know clean install a refresh what they call a refresh and i had to then reinstall all of my printers it went like that it was crazy It went a lot smoother than with Windows 7 when I used to have Windows 7. Just so quickly, the recognition was instant almost after you installed the driver. And in Windows machines, I don't know what it's like on, an, on, a, on a Mac, but on Windows, you just in, install the driver. And then you get that little question mark that says, uh, go ahead and, and, and plug in your USB and power up your printer. And of course, I already have it powered up. It's just that I haven't replugged the USB. As soon as I replug the USB, boom, done. It's recognized and it asks me if I want to print a test image or a test uh, print. And uh, so I, I can't complain. I was able to, I was dreading that, having to reinstall all of those printers. 
and it went back it went by just so smoothly that I, I just could not complain Ross photography says that he's got firmware uh, number 2070 oh boy okay we're gonna talk about that any rumors on new printers from Canon or Epson well at the Vegas Consumer Electronics Show in January, coming up in a week or so. Um, that's where all the secrets are going to be revealed. So we have to wait another week and some days before we will have anything. Of course, everything will be on YouTube and also on Yahoo. And so uh, if I come across anything, any news about any new printers, models, whatever, I will, of course, bring that information to your attention doing a regular video or maybe a live stream um iglio says i'm trying out papers now i got interested in printing last spring when i had to step in as printer for a local club show at with no notice so that's why i got the pro 1000 to try things out well that'll do it that'll do it norbert messe from Romania, Romania, as we say in Spanish. Elio says, I have an invitation to install a 2070 firmware. Don't do it. But haven't yet, I would suggest you don't do it yet. Again, you need to be able to um, prove that upgrading that firmware is going to create such a more superior printing atmosphere. Don't do it. That printer better better start giving you morning hugs and kissing you before I would upgrade that firmware. It better be something just earth shattering for me to upgrade the firmware, unless the firmware is you know solving a problem. Pro One Thousand, many years ago, was doing cleaning cycles like every the R Three Thousand from Epson. Okay, not not just Canon, you see. The R3000 was doing cleaning cycles every print. Every print. Wow, right? And what did they do to solve it? They created an upgraded firmware that addressed that problem. That's what I'm talking about. If it's going to fix something that will make your life a lot easier, then fine, then upgrade. But if it's going to possibly prevent you from using a third-party system, then I would kind of hesitate. It better be, it better be producing prints that are much better than the previous prints. That I would say yes. Go ahead and do so, even if it locked me from firm, you know, from third-party, you know, use. I would have to choose the better quality prints. But most of the time, that's not the case. They're they're addressing very minor things that sort of go unnoticed to you anyway, the user. It's just something that engineers forgot to do, so they're going to update the firmware to take care of something that's really insignificant to you, the user. So don't do it. Okay. Norbert says that he loves the show, really thought out videos and good, and good information, really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much. That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, Iglio says, okay, I want it. I want, I want. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, John Simpson says, hey, was a quick question. When I order a sample pack that comes in the side, in the side, just one type of paper, or you get a sample. Yeah, you get, he wants to know if you get the same. No, you get usually two sheets of maybe like, I don't know, five or even 10 different papers. If you want to do something um, less expensive, go to Red River and, and, you know, order a couple of their packs. They have a fine art pack and then they have a regular photography based type pack. And you will get several pairs already labeled in the back so that you know which is which. And that way you get it actually for less money per sheet than you would if you buy it later on. Also, keep an eye on many of their sales, especially so-called discontinued papers i go there and i grab some huge bargains sometimes but again not just red river but other brands as well um you know canon epson has sample packs as well so that 
it's kind of a luxury that you would not be able to afford. Say, for instance, if you had to buy like a full pack of paper from, say, 12 different surfaces, you couldn't afford to do that. That would be crazy. You buy the sample pack first. Some papers you're not going to like. You're just not going to you know, feel that they are for you. Choose the ones that you fall in love with, okay? I concentrate on about three papers. I love Red River Palo Duro Soft Gloss. I love Red River Palo Duro Etching. And I love their um, Aurora White and Natural. They have a, not a satin, it's more of a, um, what is it? Like a, like a silk surface paper where it has like a, the weave of silk, literally. It looks like very fine woven silk. I love the way that looks, and it's not glossy. It's a matte paper. Produces great results. And so those those things. So I, I, I concentrate on maybe four at the most, at the most, like five. That's it. No more than that. If you start doing dozens and dozens, playing around with dozens and dozens of different surfaces, each requiring different settings, and forget it. And profiling, forget it. You know. So stick to a few. Download them, download the profiles from their, you know, the seller's site. Red River will provide you that. So will, um, you know, Precision Colors will also provide you with free profiles for their inks for any, probably about every Red River paper, just about, not quite all of them, but they have Red River and other papers, Canon, of course, and Epson papers for particular Canon and Epson printers. You can get free profiles. And of course, Moab, you know, Hannah Mule, um, Canson, all of those companies will also provide you profiles. But the catch is it has to be for OEM ink use. They're not going to have profiles for precision colors inks, right? And Hannah Mule papers, of course not. It's going to be nothing but OEM ink. So that's the only catch. Cliff Medina says, did you ever find out if it's okay to do the latest? No, the latest update for the Pro 1000. No, again, I don't know yet. I do not know yet. You guys seem to have more newer uh, firmwares than I do. Again, remember I said 2020 is mine. You guys are up to 2060 and there's even a 70 available. Um, again, that would only apply, of course, if you're using chips to reset your your original cartridges to use your original cartridges let me finish here we'll get into this in a minute anthony pensa says hi Osa, late to your show but have been enjoying a wealth of information you share thank you jose juarez are there any small format printers you recommend for photo printing I live in New York City and I don't have space for a Canon Pro 100. Well, some of the, see, I lost track of the smaller printers because everything that's 13 inch and above seems to be dedicated for, for photo printing. So they will have at least, the very least, six die colors. So your artisan, what used to be the, what was it, the R1400 or... Stylus Color 1400, I forget what it was called, but the 1400 became the 1430 and the 1450, and they got renamed Artisan. Artisan, before that, was really an all-in-one printer with a, with a uh, scanner unit on top. And those also used a six-color dye ink set. Now they got the Expression Series. Anyway, so any of these Epson Canon printers that utilize letter-sized paper, they are mostly meant for document printing, but they will produce fairly good prints. Some of these images here, prints, were printed on a, on a um, what was it, a workforce printer, which is really supposed to be for office work. And they were printed with a workforce printer, 7780, I believe it was. And so, yeah, you can't say that the little, you know, letter size, all-in-one printers, or the so-called um, 
the ones that use uh, onboard tanks for ink. Um, yeah, they will produce relatively good prints on glossy paper, not so much on matte paper. And those printers that have a paper feed that is kind of U path, it's, a, it's shaped like a like a U. So the paper comes from a drawer underneath. It has to bend and then come out and then be on go under the plate and, and be printed on. Thicker papers cannot make that bend. Okay, so you will have a lot of feed mishaps. So you cannot expect to use those types of printers with some fine art, you know, matte paper or glossy paper that is thick. It's just not going to work. You need a, a, a pretty much a top feed type printer. So look for something. I think there's a Canon 13 inch printer that is not as massive as the, um, the Pro series. Um, if you really, really, truly don't have the room, then yeah, just get a letter size all in one printer that uses a, at least a six color ink set, uh, Canon or Epson. It doesn't really matter much in that case. Or, move things around and try to make some room yeah that would be if you could do that and you can fit a pro 100 yeah that would be the best way to go okay where do we find your email address jose well my email address is tool joe t-o-o-l-j-o-e 1949 the year I was born, at yahoo.com. Let me see if it'll allow me to uh, enter that. I know you guys can't, but maybe I can. Make sure I type that correctly. All right, there we go. I think I was able to enter it. Can you guys see it? Let me know. Uh... Cliff Medina has 2060, so that's a lot newer than mine. Al Coons, Al Coons from Canada, first time on. I have an Artisan 1430, yes. So that printer will work, and it's not as massive large as the uh, Pro 100 or Pro 10. That printer will produce great, great glossy prints. Not so good on matte paper, but great glossy prints. Beautiful color. Again, wonderful, wonderful prints. Glossy, luster, anything that's shiny will work great because it's a six-color dye ink system. All right. Okay, so let's talk about why Why the heck are we talking about firmware for the Pro 1000? Well, oh, geez. Okay, let's, let's just talk about it. So as soon as the Pro 1000 came out, and we realize, wow, the prints are amazing. As good or even a little bit, you know, a little bit better than the PA hundred. Um, certain colors are rendered better, like blues, purples, because he has dedicated blue ink. He's got a dedicated red ink. So yeah, the PA hundred still has to composite those colors. So. Again, don't get me wrong, the PA-100, again, it's just fantastic printer, but on certain images that require that extra gamut from that blue ink and that red ink, it excels, okay? But just not on every image, okay? Most of the time, your regular images will basically look the same on either printer. Pro 1000 has a better, a bit of an of a advance, uh, advantage, Chroma optimizer. So the PA-100 will sometimes display a little bit of, of a gloss differential. And the Chroma optimizer would take care of that. It just basically applies. If you use it full, which is really the most wasteful way to use it, but again, the most effective way to use it, it'll apply a full layer of the Chroma optimizer. Everything just evens out. There's absolutely no, no difference in gloss from any of the areas of the print. It'll look like a Pro 100 print, basically. So, what happens now? Oh, man, we want to refill these babies. So, I had to come up with a way to do this. And it took several months to come up with a very uh, reliable 
and repeatable method to refill these cartridges. I thought, okay, Canon is not going to let us do that. We're going to have to do some kind of, doc, you know, modification. And I thought, well, we'll drill a hole in the back and then just put a plug in and just fill them from the rear. And that still would work perfectly because these are not um, highly pressurized. They're basically gravity-fed cartridges and don't rely on a lot of internal pressurization. They do use a little bit of pressurization. It's got a very, very intelligent little spigot that goes into the printer that not only does it absorb ink out or pull ink out to feed the ink lines, the internal compartments and the printhead, it also allows air to vent back in to the cartridge because the cartridge basically is a closed unit. The only access to the outside is that poppet valve on that exit port. That's it. There's no vents. There's nothing on it. So you couldn't just suck ink out. That cart would collapse. So you need to suck ink out and as well allow air to get back in to replenish, you know, the space that you created. So I had to come up with a method using a special tip that would allow you to either vacuum feed the cartridge or vacuum fill it or pressure feed, fill it. Either method will work. Either method is easy to do. I have videos doing that, performing that function using the precision colors method and both of my two methods. Either one with either one of those three will work. Now, when you buy the inks, which were developed over almost a nine month period, you get exactly the same amount of ink that you need to refill one cartridge that way you don't have say 12 ml left over that what the hell are you going to do with 12 ml right so you get exactly what you need that way you pay the least amount of money for the correct amount of ink wonderful idea we discussed that when we were trying to figure out how this ink should be sold or offered to you guys so refilling is solved no problem the ink set was wonderful no problem oh boy what about chips you see because these cartridges or these chips cannot be reset just like the pro one cannot be reset what makes you think for even one second that the company that made the the resetters for the pro 100 and the pro 10 couldn't possibly come up with a way to reset pro one cartridges of course not but how many Pro Ones do you guys own? By the way, let's see how many people we got on board. We got 55 people here. How many of you own a Pro One? Let me know right now in the chat. And how many of you own a Pro 1000? How many of you own a Pro 10? Everyone that's here, tell me what printer you own, if it's a Canon printer. I just want to come up with a an idea of numbers. The Pro One wasn't that popular. It didn't sell enough units for the company who makes resetters to care, to spend the you know research and development money required to break the codes on those chips, that particular family of chips. You cannot tell me that the Pro 1 chips are so drastically different than the Pro 10 chips. No, you couldn't make me believe that in a minute for a second they just didn't bother to to come up with a way because it just wasn't worth it they were not going to be able to recoup the expense that they would have to spend to produce that resetter pro 10 yeah hell yeah pro 100 absolutely thousands of resetters were sold yes pro 1 no way pro 1000 i don't think they even wanted to tackle it so we have a Pro 1000 printer that produces ridiculously good prints. We have a great ink set, easy to refill the original cartridges with zero modification required. Okay, the same exact cartridge. The only thing you need to do is remove the front cap. The printer has just basically the compartment and the cap. And the compartment is integrated with the exit port and the valve. So compartment, exit port and valve, and then the cap that slips over the front on two little tabs, maybe four. And that cap holds a little floating holder 
which then holds the chip, which is read by the chip reader internally in the printer. All we have to do is remove the cap and exchange the holder for a single-use chip holder or a auto-reset chip and holder. The single-use chips work perfectly, 12 bucks each. They work just fine. Use them once, refill for about maybe, oh, I don't know. I forget how much it costs. Let's look it up. Let's look it up. But consider the fact that you will be paying about, mm, let's see. We are the Pro 1000, Pro 1000 page here. And refill supplies. Let's go ahead and jump over to full desktop and by the way i hope we don't screw this up this time so here we are everybody can see the uh, desktop so here we have the image program for pro 1000 okay so 12 bucks for a, a load of 82 ml that gives you an extra 2 ml which you can actually pack in there it's fine you can actually inject 82 ml instead of just 80 that way you have a little bit of a cushion mm. so 12 bucks plus 12 bucks for the chip that's 24 dollars per refill you would normally pay 60 dollars per cartridge this is what it looks like as you can see this is the the holder and chip now they prepare these in-house they buy the chips from a provider they buy the holder from a provider and then they weld mount the chips in place. Here is a special tip and then the bottle cap. So basically you're going to replace this cap with this cap and use that to refill it. You're going to use the bottle itself as a pressure or vacuum filling uh, unit. And again, there's a video that shows you how to do that on their site or you can spend $35 for OEM. In fact, you will have to spend $35 for red, blue, yellow, and chroma optimizer. But for those of you who want to use nothing but OEM ink and still keep it at a reasonable price, so $35 plus $12 would be $47. Okay? So you can buy nothing but OEM. You can buy them as you need to buy them. You don't have to buy everything at once. So twelve dollars plus thirty-five, that is what forty-seven dollars basically instead of sixty. So that's what you do. Twelve dollars for single use chips, they work perfectly, or buy the permanent, so-called permanent chip for twenty-five dollars. Now, the idea between these um regular single use chips and the permanent ones are of course, as you guys know. They're supposed to auto reset, okay? And there has been some problems. It's not a wide, widely known problem or experienced problem yet, but so far, two people, one of them on my Facebook group, expressed the situation as not being able to re reset certain cartridges. One or two, I believe it was. And a member that's here with us tonight, we will not mention who he is, also experienced that. And he had it on three uh, cartridges. And you're listening right now. You know who you are. I Please don't, don't um, interact with me right now during this discussion because I want to kind of keep it incognito at this point. And so... The three colors that whose chips did not reset as as designed resided in one of the groups because the Pro 1000 is divided into three groups of colors or inks. What does that mean? That means the purge unit literally has three different chambers. So when the purge unit is sealed against the nozzle plate of the printhead, you can isolate colors, four colors per bank, in other words. 
So in case you need to do a, a cleaning cycle, a manual cleaning cycle, say you have a clog on photo black on PBK. So if you have a clog on PBK, you're going to then do a, a uh, clean cycle only on that zone that contains PBK. Okay, you don't want to do a global cleaning cycle, including all the other colors, because why should you suck out ink on all the colors that you really don't need to suck out ink on, of or from because they are flowing okay. So they incorporated, instead of having a single unit, one zone containing all 12 colors, they broke it down into four chambers and so or four zones. So the theory here is this. All auto reset chips work this way, the modern ones. It used to be, I'll give you an idea what they used to be like. They would reset after any power interruption to the chip. Imagine what a what a catastrophe that would be on a Canon printer if you went away for a day or two and you had a power uh, glitch, not a total outage, but a little glitch where the power went off for a couple of seconds. When you come back, all of your chips would be full. Yeah, because it interrupted the power to the chip. And your cartridges would not be full. And then you don't notice and you continue printing, you'll burn out your printhead. You will, because you get to the point where cartridge that was at half, but it really read as full. You continue printing. Now it's empty, drawing air into the printhead and burning up that channel. And your ink indicator is still at 50%. Uh-oh. You see what I'm saying? So now the cartridge chip reads empty. Okay, it has to read empty. And then you remove it. And by doing that, you interrupt power to the chip, right? So you have to remove the, the cartridge, fill it. And when you pop it back in, you then reintroduce power to the chip. And that will take your ink counter code and reset it to full. And if everything is operating correctly, your indicator on your LCD of your Pro 1000 should indicate that yellow is full now. It should not give you any kind of weird message like uh, you're using, you know, non-genuine cartridges or anything like that. When you install those auto reset chips and you pop each cartridge in as you need, when the OEM one goes empty, you remove it, you put one of the ones that you modify with a auto reset chip, it sees it as a genuine cartridge. It does. All my 12 uh, cartridges are now using auto reset chips on my Pro 1000 with firmware 2.0.2.0.2.0. Okay. So I have an older one that I think older than anything you guys have. So there you go. So, I am not even close to be able to reset one of those chips yet. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Everything is still reading pretty much full. So here's what's happening. It might be, and I think this was the discussion. It might be that it's a particular chip and it's, it's not the same color chip doing this. It's, random if a chip goes bad it will affect the other four the other three chips in that particular bank okay so then none of those chips will be able to reset or they will start acting strangely reporting weird things in your lcd that your cartridge is not genuine or is counterfeit or something like that so you guys also have to realize that these chips are made by one company in China. And, you know, they're one of the best hackers in the world, right? So as far as this stuff goes. So when an importer from the United States or Canada or the UK starts importing these chips, guess what? <laughs> to tell you the truth, they haven't really been tested by anyone, including the, the factory. All they know is that when you put them into a printer, they're recognized as genuine chips. That's all they know. Do they reset? You'll only know when it's time to reset. And um, that's the case. So now we're finding out that some people are having problems with these chips. I may end up with the same problem. And on the other hand, I may not. It just depends. 
Is it related to firmware uh, version? I don't know yet. We really don't know yet. If that is the case, if that would be the case, then yellow, magenta, photo magenta, photo cyan, cyan, blue, you know, every other color on those other banks would also not be able to reset. We will know. We will know soon. The way that I am going to discuss this with precision colors, because I know that they sell these chips, and they're not the only ones, um, is to go ahead and run a system clean on one of those banks and just deplete most of the ink until you reach a point where one of those cartridges is empty, declared empty. You could do that by doing a system clean. You don't have to print forever until a cartridge is empty. You don't have to do that. You can just run a system clean on, say, group one, and then see, or zone one, and then see what happens when one of those cartridges is declared empty. You may have to run two system cleans. That will then fill up one of your maintenance cartridges. Of course it will. But that's the only way for to do a real-world test. But then again, if it's a, a random failure of, of chips, say, let's just pick magenta chips. If one of those magenta chips randomly fails and then that failure causes the other chips in that particular group to also fail. You see what I'm saying? So it causes like a little snowball effect. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me switch over to the driver and I'll show you what I, we are referring to. Those of you who own the Pro 1000 know exactly what I'm talking about. So let's quickly find my devices and printers and I'll switch over to full desktop we'll locate the pro 1000 right click printing preferences okie doke so let's go over here and look maintenance cleaning you see cleaning right here and then deep cleaning and then system cleaning notice how many more droplets of ink are shown here one three what six so this is a huge cleaning folks now notice all of these cleaning categories allow you to choose a different zone or group. So say for instance, we're going to do a, a system clean and look what it says. System cleaning consumes much more ink than deep cleaning. Execute system cleaning only if nozzle condition does not improve after deep cleaning. Be sure to click initial check items and then check the displayed items. After each system cleaning ends, execute nozzle check to check whether the print head nozzles have been unclogged. All right, so let's just say that group one was the one affected, okay? So why should I run, right? Why should I run a, 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 a cleaning cycle on some other group? like this one here or this one here or all of them that would be extremely wasteful i would literally empty out all my inks imagine if i was using oem inks oh good lord that would be a huge loss of money if one of these chips here pbk mbk co or gy immediately refuses to reset that's the group and what might happen is that maybe it was the PBK that became empty first, and by some chance that chip was bad. None of these other chips will probably work. Okay? So that's that's what we're trying to determine. The same thing would go here. Blue, yellow, magenta, photocyan. If magenta chip would not work, would not reset, maybe the other ones will not reset either. But if magenta ink resets, then the other ones are fine, unless there's a random failure on some of the other chips. And like I said, these chips are basically sold without any real-world testing because, I don't know, I don't know what's going on with the uh, companies that sell these. I don't know what the quality control is like whatsoever. Again, you're dealing with a foreign manufacturer, a foreign market, that you know sold us all of these um refillable sets of cartridges for the pro for the pa hundred and then come to realize 
that they did not work with North American printers. They didn't know that. They didn't have a North American printer to test it on. In fact, even if they did, all they would have done was pop it in, and if it gets accepted and it prints for a while, that's as far as the testing goes. So, we need more time. That's all I'm trying to say. And uh, again, I'm on the same boat as everyone else. Okay, I'm on the same boat. I am using those chips, and uh, I will find out soon. I will find out soon, and as soon as I get either a error or a successful reset, I'll let you guys know. Now, the people who have gotten errors during a attempt to reset these chips, basically what they need to do, and what they have done already, is to contact Precision Colors. They need all of this information. They need all of this data. They don't have real-world data and information. So we users are the ones that need to then verify when something does not work correctly. And that happens with any auto reset system. Many of these sets of cartridges with, with mounted auto reset chips have been sold for other printers. P600, okay, R3000, P400, 3880, 3800. All of these printers had systems that work with the auto reset type chips. And again, my R2000 that I absolutely love. I have to wait until a cartridge reaches empty. And then I take it out, fill it, pop it back in, and it resets. I could take out that cartridge at any time and top it off, which I do. I, I like to maintain my cartridges basically filled with ink. But the chip is not empty, so it will not reset. The chip needs to reach empty. And one odd thing that you will see is a weird error. It's like your cartridge cannot be recognized, and you freak out because you think that's actual, you know, a problem. No, it just means it's empty. That happens on my R3000. And you just simply remove it and pop it back in. With my cartridges, they have a little reset button, but those are not really super reliable. Um, but the newer ones, you remove it and you pop it back in. In fact, for the P600, they even have a resetter so that you can then manually reset all of the cartridges and top them all off at once and start from fresh every single time. Otherwise, you will be refilling a cart and resetting it, and then other carts will need to allow, you know, will need to reach empty before they can be auto reset. Pro 1000, you have to wait till they're empty. You will first get the yellow warning, meaning that I'm low. Please be aware that I'm about to go empty in a few weeks. Simply all that means is that as uh, soon as the yellow warning goes on, I weighed one of mine, and I had 18 grams of ink still left. So that's, you know, somewhere around 18 ml of ink left. So that's quite a bit of ink. I could still print quite a lot. So, once it reaches that empty point, though, you get a red X. And on most other printers, the red X will tell you that now you cannot print any longer. If you, if you initiate a print, it's not going to print. Pro 1000 is a little bit different animal. It has internal compartments. It has a secondary storage of ink internally. So it's going to kind of give you an option that, hey, dude, um, if you try to print something, be aware that you run out of ink on your cart or you're about to run out of ink in your cart. So do you want to print or not? So you kind of say, okay, no, I don't want to print. So, but when the red X is indicated, that means that the chip has declared it empty. So when you remove it and pop it back in, it should reset. It should reset. So what I need from all of you users, you guys told me here what you guys have. I'm going to go ahead and reiterate what you guys provided me. I asked you a question. You, I got a uh, 1430 from uh, Epson. I got a 100 from Canon. I got a Pro 10 and Pro 1000, Pro 1000, Pro 10, Pro 1000, Pro 10, Pro 100, Pro 1000, Pro, Pro 100 and Pro 1000. A P A P four hundred and I X sixty eight twenty. Okay, 
None of these are included in this little mix because we're referring to Canon printers here. I want to know what the ratio. I want to know if anyone has a Pro 1. That was my thing. Pro 100, Pro 100, Pro 4000. I'm jealous. Rudy, you got a Pro a Pro 4000? Wow, I am really jealous. Uh had a Pro 10, uh blah 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 blah, 3800, Pro 1000. You see no one here has a Pro 1. That answers that question why the Pro 1 never got a, re a resetter made for it. The answer is there. None of you have a Pro 1. I'm the only one in this group tonight that has a Pro 1, and I got it out of necessity so that I can help you guys with any Pro 1 needs. But again, that is why uh, it's demand. It's, it's, you know, it's all related to um, user demand. And so, you know, I got somebody has a uh, R3000. Somebody wants to, okay, wait a minute. So, uh, let's see. So at this point, yeah, it's a mystery. It's a total mystery. Um, I I know for a fact that over 200 full sets of chips have been sold. So there's at least 200 people out there, 200 Pro 1000 printers that may be either using all 12 already with the auto reset chips or partially. Uh, how many of those have actually reset their printers, you know, without any issues? See, when something goes right, nobody ever posts anything. It's when things go wrong. That's when people immediately go to a Facebook group and, you know, share with me that they're having a problem with resetting uh, chips that don't reset. Same thing with DP Review. I have not heard anyone. I did an APB where I asked people with Pro 1000s that were using auto reset chips if they were having any problems. So far, nobody. Nobody. So... I don't know if the lack of answers indicates that they're not having problems or that no one has had a need to reset, you see? And I'm going to open it right here. I asked I asked, asked a question. I got one answer back. And basically referring to the guy on my Facebook group, Vlad. So that goes to show you that it seems to be pretty rare so far and again i don't know because there's no way that i can tell if those over 200 folks have actually had to reset any cartridges yet see you will only know if they work or not when you have to reset them same thing with my p800 when my p800 you know one of those um, chips inside that decoder board that i have mounted externally and internally connected, bypassing the regular chip reading mechanism of the printer. I don't know what's going to happen when one of those chips goes empty. Then I can reset all nine chips back to full. Is it going to work? I certainly hope so. We'll see. We'll have to see. So there's no way that I can, you know, shed any light as to what's going on with that. But we hope that... It's really just a random thing. Uh, the two people, one of them is here tonight and one of them is not here. The other one that's not here received replacement chips. They exchanged them and they're working fine. Now, what does receiving replacement chips mean? Let's just say, well, let's just use Photo Black, uh, PBK. So the PBK chips are do they have individual id codes for pbk or are they all the same you know code we don't know if they are individual id codes then it will see it as a new id code and it will accept it initially but is it going to reset we don't know is the resetting problem due to the firmware we don't know again i'm a good guinea pig because i have an older firmware older than any one of yours so if it works for me but it doesn't work for you then that information needs to be sent back to the manufacturers so that they can then create and replenish replenish 
Are they, are they going to do that? I don't think so. You know, those of you who have chips that no longer work with, say, 2060 or 2070 firmware. Yeah, it's a serious, it's a serious problem. Um, again, um, I could say that nobody told us to, uh, you know, do this type of, uh, shenanigans with our printer well you know we, you knew we were going to do that everybody knew that we were going to try to do that so anyway let's see what else we got here um so you saw that the the, the group of people that had a, a pro one none not one and i'm going to ask on my facebook group because i got at least almost two thousand people there see who has i'm going to do a poll who has a pro one and say uh, compared to the pro 1000 same ink set, folks. The same, basically the same output. Actually, no, I'm totally wrong. Not the same ink set. There's no blue in the Pro 1. No blue. So maybe that's why. I don't know. I don't know why the popularity of the Pro 1, of the Pro 1000 over the Pro 1, since it was more expensive and more massive and everything. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Anyway, Rob's Photography, well, the price of refilling OEM at $35 and one time chip for 12, that's 47. A brand new card is 59. Refilling OEM is still cheaper with a one time use chip. Yeah. And, you know, let me share this with you guys in case you guys didn't know. This is basically, you know, inside information that I'm, I'm spilling out here. Um, he, um, the com let's just say the company PC did buy both batches of both types of uh, cartridges cartridges no chips and he hasn't sold a single single use chip no pun intended not one so i don't know what kind of batch he has left on that and um maybe i can have him send me a set and i can then load the current empties that i have with those and just test them out just to see see what happens um but yeah he hasn't sold a single you know single use chip which means that the investment that he actually you know put out there purchasing sufficient numbers of these chips you know thinking that he was going to be selling them in sets um that's that's putting him in the red basically so uh we'll see that's a that's a little of a touchy subject right there so right now um again i would be i would be in tears if that had happened to me um but again um for these things to be verified they need to be used and they, then the users really should provide feedback of the you know, either the reliability of the system or the unreliability of the system so that they can, it can be solved. Believe me, it can be solved. It can indeed be solved. But the manufacturers have full control over this, not the seller. The seller really has to take their word for it. Even Inkjet Mall went through hell with some of these new systems because they only, they only work with Epson. So yeah. They actually tested some chips for the not so inexpensive P5000s. They were thrilled that these chips had been developed. So they got samples of them. They had their technician, which is a young lady that's an expert, an expert at printer maintenance, especially large format printer maintenance and refilling and you name it. I mean, she is really, really good. She does all of the uh, videos, their technical videos for uh, Inkjet Mall. So they set up some refillable cartridges with these chips, fill them up with their ink set, which they have an ink set already made for the uh, so-called um, HD uh, inks for these uh, new families of uh, sure color printers. They cranked up the printers and the motherboards fried. It wasn't just a case of the chip not being recognized. It wasn't a simple case of like little, you know, recognition errors, maybe. 
No, no, no. The printers were dead to the world, like a like a doornail. Okay. Um, how much would one of those printers sells for? Like twenty seven hundred dollars. Well, so you know, guess what they did? They tested them on another P five thousand and another P five thousand. Three of them. Look at my fingers. Three of them. All three burnt motherboards. Could you then go back and sue the Chinese company that sold them those chips? They never said. They really didn't say. I actually got a letter, an email, private email from John Cohn telling me this. And so, hey, all they could do is to have a technician come over and replace those motherboards and reset everything to normal again. And that's where it stands at this moment. Now, it sounds like they were able to find some reliable chips for the SCP-6000 6, and up. 6000 up to like the P-9000 or something like that. So they have refilling systems for those printers. And I have not heard anything else about the P-5000 at this point. So, see, it happens to a, you know, a company as small as two or three people and a company as big and huge as Inkjet Mall. It happens. This is a unknown world out there, full of uh, mysteries, full of uh, unverifiable uh, promises. And sometimes they just don't, you know, they don't work out. So any of you that have a P5000, stick with your OEM inks at this point, folks, please. Because there's really nothing out there. They Epson did a really fantastic job locking us out of those uh, options. There's no way that we can uh, save money by switching quickly to a third-party source. Anyway, so we have a response here from someone. This is not the person. Oh, Rob's Photography says, I have use i have of single use i have of single use chips for pc from pc are you trying to say that you have used single use chips from pc read your sentence again read your entry here and tell me if that's what you mean because that would be really interesting to know i would want to know that and dan beetle says uh, mike from PC called me earlier this week and told me he has no longer going to be selling single-use chips. Yeah, well, that's what he told me as well, okay? Because he hasn't sold a single one. So why should you, you know, keep that inventory? So I'm going to talk to him about that because since it's, he's not going to sell them, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll test them out. I'm sure if any of you have tested them out and they do work, please let me know. He told me he hadn't sold a one. So, I don't know. Maybe Ross Photography has used them. Um, they're also available through the Alibaba.com people. You can find them there. It's just that you have to order from China. And it takes quite a while for them to arrive here. And then, if you need to send them back, oh, what a pain in the neck that would be. So, speaking of that, if any of you Pro 1000 users that are using these auto reset chips have a problem, they will send you a new chip, but you really should take that chip and the little chip um, body, the little chip holder, and send it back to PC so that they can then send it to China and get credit on their account for that chip being bad. Otherwise, they're out, they're paying like 20 something dollars almost you pay 25 he makes like two to three dollars per chip really not too much so he's paying quite a bit of money um for those chips to make them available for us um they have um chips for the pro 2000 as well but i don't know for what volume because the pro 2000 and up uses three different size cartridges the largest being uh, 700 ml. So the 
Chip ID codes should be recognized by either printer, the 2000, 4000, or the 6000. So just because I say it's for the R2000 really means nothing. It should be uh, good across the board. All those three printers should be able to use them. It's just that I am not sure what level of ink volume those chips actually you know, report. Is it for the smaller cartridges or is it for the big cartridges? So that we do not know. And I'm going to ask Mike about that and see if he wants to go ahead and continue to uh, develop something for the larger uh, Canon printers. I think he told me he was going to try to do that this year. Ross Photography says that he does have a set of single-use chips. So have you used them? Are they, are they able to be used successfully? Single-use chips for the Pro 1000 go for $160 for a set of 12. So imagine that if you were to buy one at a time cartridges for the Pro 1000, that would run you probably close to $700. Um, that's a give or take, uh, depending what source you get them from. If you get them for a bit less than $60 or $59, uh, that's still a savings. That's still a big savings, especially since you only have to buy uh, four OEM colors if you want to stick with the hybrid uh, ink set or if you go full OEM that's still $47 per set per cartridge instead of um, you know 59 so you save some money you save some money no 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 not the pro one not the pro one he is not selling chips for the pro 1000 single use chips anymore apparently you can still buy chips for the Pro One. That was 200 Mike with a K at the end. He says, so are you saying that I cannot order chips for my Pro One? Oh, so there you go. We got one Pro One user. You see what I'm saying? Not a very popular printer. It really didn't sell that many units. Rob's photographer says, I have not used them as of yet. My gray is going low in in the printer though okay so once you do very likely it will be accepted i don't see any problems with those chips just like i didn't see a single problem with the so-called auto reset chips here's what they were doing and it's probably better quality control than the chinese factory they receive a batch of say single use chips they receive a batch of auto reset chips. They come in a in a in a sealed bag, okay, labeled you know uh, gray or or chroma optimizer auto reset. And so you get, for instance, let's just say a batch of yellow chips, single use, a batch of yellow chips, uh, auto reset, and a bunch of holders. So one person in another room is welding the single use yellow chips onto holders holders. Another person in the other room is doing the auto reset chips onto their holders, those holders. So you end up with separate batches. Then they are marked yellow, a certain color code. Say the auto reset chips are red with a red marker and the single use chips are black marker. That way, when you receive them, if you receive black, then you know you're getting single use chips. If you, if you receive the ones that have their color codes marked by, say, red, then you know you got the auto reset chips. And it's been working very well. So there should be minimal, if not zero error, okay, between, you know, batches. So I did ask him, but he forgot what, you know, he doesn't remember right now. But basically, I, I want him to go back and I want him to verify what color marker they're using to write on the body of the chip, the little chip holder, the white chip holder that you get. The OEM is black. The one you get is white. And onto that white little chip holder, it'll say PBK in with a marker, permanent marker, and it'll be a certain color. So that's what I need to do so that I can verify whether I receive auto reset chips or not from him or anyone else did for that matter 
Imagine if you received, um, you know, a chip that doesn't reset and you're going to automatically think it's a single use chip, right? That would be logical. But, you know, not if it's coded for auto reset in red ink, for instance. So that's something we have to verify and, and explore. Anthony Pensa has an IPF 6200. Okay, that's a little older one. Uh, no, the 6400 was the more modern series after that one. Uh, the marker on on Rob's photography is silver. And those are what? Single use? Let me see what I have. Let me pop out a card out of my Pro 1000 right now. Okay, I just popped out a card. I gotta quickly put it back. So here's the chip holder. This is Chroma Optimizer. So see what I mean? So that's what it looks like. And this is in black. Okay. So I am assuming that all other single use chips would be in another color. Okay, so that's what I am assuming is going on. Now I got to make sure I put this back in the correct way. So that is it. So, you know, you're not going to get, um, say, for instance, a since I verified these are black and yours are silver, then I am assuming that I have auto reset chips and you do not. You have single use chips. I'm going to pop this back in. All right, done. And by the way, the LCD said it was a genuine Chrome Optimizer cartridge. So there you go. I don't know what else to say. Um, again, we will know once I begin to try to reset some of these chips. And so that's when we will know what's going on. So, all righty. Yeah, the chip is white and the marking is a silver color. So, um, all of the chip holders are white. So that has no, no bearing in, in the, uh, identification of one class of chip over the other. But maybe I'll call him tomorrow. Tomorrow should be a day of rest for him. I don't think he's going to be doing any orders tomorrow. So, We'll, we'll go ahead and uh, straighten this out, and hopefully it'll be just an isolated problem. Um, but what I was saying earlier, uh, when you return the chip back to him, he has sent you already a new one for you to replace the one that's malfunctioning. Um, it should see it as fine. Okay, it should, it should accept it. Now, how does that work? Because... Either here, here's the theory behind this this sort of a thing. Say, for instance, like the Pro One. Okay, the Pro One has auto reset chips. Are those no? The Pro One has single use chips. Are those single use chips contain separate individual ID codes for any any given color, so that the printer never sees the same ID code for yellow? Or magenta and it keeps accepting them of course they cannot be reset because you know it'll see the same id code or are you getting red chips all the same id code it's just that they are all at full level and the printer doesn't care to see the same id code for red so you have two two ways either the printer doesn't care or you're getting chips that have 
distinctly different ID codes for red, for yellow. So in a batch of 100 yellow chips, you got 100 individual different ID codes. See, so the, the printer sees it as a different entity and then it accepts it as being full. So if I have a chip that doesn't work and I send that back to Mike and Mike sends me a new chip, hopefully he'll send me the new chip first and I insert it into my printer, the printer accepts it. Is it because it's seeing a different ID code or the printer doesn't care? And if that is the case, then single use chips for the Pro 1000, do they have different ID codes? Or are they all the same ID code and the Pro 1000 doesn't care? That's a mystery no one seems to know. Even Mike. So I, I did discuss that with him earlier. By the way, I had a scare before this um, live stream began where I could not get my silly camera. You right there actually was OBS's fault. The open broadcast software or studio was not seeing my camera and it's a pain in the neck. I don't know whether it's uh, Windows 10 that doesn't quite get along with it or what. But I almost ended up having to just do a desktop grab and uh, just talk behind the scenes. Um, but hopefully that will not be something that will be recurring every Saturday. Um, just happened to happen today. It just, it just by chance it took place today. So anyway, let's go ahead since I think we're done with the chat here. And by the way, chat rhymes with super chat. So oh boy as soon as january hit okay here's what happens as soon as january hits all of you who maybe some of you are in the corporate world and you know that companies they blow their budgets before the end of the the uh, calendar year so all of the advertisement dollars were just blown the last couple of weeks of december so most youtubers did have very good December revenue. And uh, especially if you're huge. Us small guys, you know, it was okay. So, once January hits, those new budgets have not been put out. So, the ads are very limited. I'm getting really good number of views daily. But there's just simply no ads placed on the video. So, the earnings have gone down to just a few dollars a day. So, again... These are rough months. The first quarter of the year is really a rough time. So I'm thinking that if I wanted to buy, I wanted to buy some um, uh, papers to try out. And so that's why I'm kind of like, you know, contacting some company to see if they, if they would be willing to provide me with some papers for no money for me to test and then review on their behalf on various printers in yeah, so far, no good. It's like nobody seems to care. So, especially as soon as they find out, uh, oh, you're using third party? Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to deal with you. We don't want to deal with you at all. So, anyway, so yeah. Any super chance you guys are wishing to uh, bestow on the channel tonight would be greatly appreciated before we go off the air. It's now 7.49, so we've been on for about hour and 15 minutes Let's go back to uh, DP Review because there's a lot of stuff there. I could not believe how much stuff we got uh, this past week. Q Image Ultimate or question mark. Let's look at that. Why not, right? Make a decision soon for a printing program. I am on the last days of my Q Image Ultimate trial. I have printed with Lightroom and Q Image Ultimate. And QMH Ultimate does things Lightroom cannot. Okay, that's going to star some flames, I know. People like, look at that. See, all you had to do was ask. Thank you, Robert Gully. Happy New Year to you too, my friend. If you have any questions, super chatters get priority over any questions they may have. That's how it works on a live stream. Maybe mine is a little bit different, but most live streams that I watch, I just go back and I go, oh my God, this guy is, you know, look at all the super chats he's getting. Yeah, maybe I'm just not putting out valuable enough information. But anyway, thank you so much, Robert. Appreciate that so much. Let's go back to this. Talking about Q Image because I'm a huge fan of Q Image. Let's see what this guy wants to ask here. 
he says that he has printed out of Lightroom and QImage. Now, I find that both platforms are really good for printing. QImage has advantages over Lightroom in lay, layout uh, a lot and also has, you know, algorithm advantages also, especially when it needs to resize up, up res or down res regardless. It will always send the proper amount of pixels per inch for a particular brand printer. Whatever that printer's native resolution is, it will then take that image and reinterpolate or no, upsize or downsize so that, for instance, a Canon printer receives 600 pixels per inch, no more than that. See, Canon printers need 300 or 600 pixels per inch to print at its native native resolution. Epson is 360 or 720. That's why you will always see resolution figures at 720 and multiples of that number, multiples of 360, 720, and what is it, 1440 and 2880 for Epson. Super high printing dots per inch resolution. And dots per inch is different than pixels per inch, so don't get confused with that. So QImage does have advantages over Lightroom. I don't think Lightroom can do that unless you specifically type in 300 if you're printing out of a uh, Canon printer and you specifically type in 360. will not do that for you automatically. QImage will do that for you automatically, which is pretty cool. He says, for the record, I shoot 72. I have, a, I guess that's a camera, Canon maybe. I have an Epson P600 loaded with Precision Colors inks. See what I've created? The reason everybody's using Precision Colors inks, I think it's, it's due to, to this channel. And use color managed workflow so far, mostly with the PC supplied, um, probably, um, he says drivers, but really he means ICC profiles for Red River papers. Depending on which paper I use, considering making my own profiles at some point, maybe. Okay, so he's just basically basically generalizing that he's having a good time with QImage. Let's see what someone else has. QImage is one of the few great bargains in software. There really isn't much else. And if it is, if it fulfills a real need for your printing workflow, just get it. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And it goes on for many, many, many uh, replies here. So again, um, Q image is, is just loaded with features. Yes, the QI, no, the UI, not QI, the UI is totally different than anything you might be used to. Um, the menu structure is different than, say, Photoshop. But then again, so is Lightroom. Lightroom is not the same as Photoshop. Um, but anyway, so that's something you have to get used to, just like with any program. Just get, get used to the way you use it, study it, learn it. Don't spend too much time learning or, or you know, losing sleep over features that you really don't use. Just learn what you need to use. Master that. I only know about 10% of Photoshop. But what I know, I know how to use, okay? I only know a maybe a fraction of what QImage can do. But what I do know, I know how to use. And Mike, if he's not here tonight with us, unfortunately. But he always uh, teaches me and corrects me when I do something not quite right. He's very gentle with me. And speaking of that, since we're in the QImage um, uh, subject, he sent me some new information, things that I need to look out for in several points so that I can then design the video that I'm about to produce showing you guys how to print on a Canon printer with fine arts, you know, source, fine arts paper source, loading from the manual feeder and so forth, like all of these papers require you to do, and still print with a quarter inch border instead of the huge border. Or if you choose to print with a large border, you can also apply. But it allows you to then apply those borders manually, okay? And there's some things that need to be set just right so that this system will work, this little hack. At the end, what happens is that the 
QImage will send that and bypass the driver uh, restrictions somehow. So there's, a, again, like I said, there's a couple of things you need to do. When you click yes on that little hack and you're printing with the manual feeder, and what's the manual feeder? Well, it's that one in the very rear of the printer where you manually feed the paper and you feed it until it stops and you go back to your computer. And normally what it'll do is it will ask you to, you know, you want to continue printing and you say yes. Then you sometimes got to go to the printer and press the paper advance button, which is blinking yellow at you. These warnings will not pop up on your computer, on your QImage interface. You'll still have to walk over to your printer and click that little paper advance button so that the printer will then continue printing. And there's some uh, things that you need to make sure you have correctly set. Otherwise, positioning of the image will vary. So if you want the correct positioning that you had envisioned when you laid out that image onto your paper size, even though it might be it might be canvas paper or canvas media, not paper, media that has to be fed through that manual feeder, you will be able to print maybe even borderless, okay? And normally you cannot. On fine art media, you cannot print borderless. So... I'm going to be looking into every aspect. Of it. I want to do this correctly so that the video that I produce will reach as many people as possible and will have correct information instead of something that later on I find out cannot be done. Like the one that I did a while back. I had to actually delete that video from YouTube because I realized this is not going to work. So again, you know, I made a few bucks on that video and then I lost a few bucks on that video because I had to delete it. And once you do that, that's it. You lose whatever views you had. So anyway, we'll take care of that. Advice on which calibration device and why do you want a calibration device? So you can have your monitor perfectly calibrated. So when you guys look at my monitor, okay, and you look at this, and for instance, I open up, um, let's open up Lightroom. Let's go ahead and open up Lightroom. It's going to take a few seconds to open here. And we'll load up an image. And I want you guys to look at, just look at the, the overall gray here. See this gray area? And tell me at your end, say for instance, like right here. This is a nice neutral gray. If you guys are looking at this on your monitor or your phone or your tablet, and this doesn't look neutral to you, which it does to me here. It is perfectly neutral right now. That means your device is not properly calibrated. That's what I mean by calibration. This, these colors here, all of these areas here, they're all neutral shades of gray. Nothing has a hue. And if my monitor was not calibrated, then this whole display here would not look neutral. It would have a certain tint. It will be a little yellowish or a little bluish or so forth. So that's what I mean. So in order to be able to display what you see neutral, you have to have your monitor calibrated. And that's just, you know, that is just something that everyone needs to do and everyone needs to consider when they buy a printer. You're going to seriously get into photo printing and editing you know, do some really fine editing of your image, your work that you're so proud of. You have to calibrate your monitor. You have to. Imagine if your camera by itself produced files, raw files, or pay, or JPEGs that were consistently pink. You would have to calibrate that camera somehow if it was even possible. But that's what's happening when your monitor is not calibrated. It's shifted a certain direction color-wise. Or brightness and then you shift that back visually by adjusting your images guess what you're creating consistently bad edits because you did not start from a perfectly balanced display to begin with so that is why it's a serious of course it's serious if you want to get serious at this you have to consider that and it's not just the printer you buy a printer for a thousand bucks you got to spend another 500 bucks on a on an x-ray uh, i1 Studio, period. You just have to do that. And when you do that, you get extras with it. You get that little uh, passport um, card. 
you can't beat that because then you can fix your camera's output with that. If your camera's output is a little bit off, you can fix that with that. Every shoot that you do, you take a picture of that passport card and that has standard color patches that have to then be, you know, corrected for. Just like you correct a profile. When you create a profile, you use one of these devices to correct the errors the printer introduced to those values that you wanted to print on those charts. Do I have any charts here? Let me see. Yes, I do. Let me take one of these out just randomly out here. These are these are charts that I have made for people or have they have printed them for me. So what am I referring to? Think of this. Oh, that is not even a, a print. I think this guy sent me some extra sheets of paper blank for me to try on my own. So here's a here's a set of patches. So you download this image, or if you have the software, you create that set of patches and you print it. And those values, multitude of little tiny color squares, right? You print those using the correct settings, which means that you're not going to use color management in your driver when you print these patches. You want to print them raw. So whatever color that was, maybe that wasn't the value sent to it. So it, it got printed a certain way. So when you scan them, you're going to scan them and then recognize that, wait a minute, this particular color does not match the value that's sent to the printer. So you have to correct it by changing this. And so it creates a whole list of corrections, a whole set of individual corrections. And guess what? This is not enough patches. You need like 16 million colors, okay? So what it's going to do is going to make corrections for all of these and then kind of interpolate between. And it's going to create a profile, and that profile will help your printer best reproduce as accurate as possible the values you send to it. Now, the values you send to it had better be correct unless your monitor is not calibrated. If it's not calibrated, then you're going to probably change things and make it worse. So on a camera, you shoot that passport card. Then you continue doing your shoot on your same lighting conditions. And then you load that image of that card onto your software for the uh, X-ray color checker passport software. It will scan those patches and say, oh, your sensor made a mistake. Your sensor did not reproduce these known colors correctly. So we're going to create a correction profile. Yeah. And then you apply that profile to all of your images. All of a sudden, boom, like magic. All these colors are brought back as accurate as they should have been captured by your lens and sensor. Right there, you're starting off with a corrected raw file. It only works with raw files. Corrected raw files, a properly calibrated monitor. Wow, you got two things already in your favor. Okay. And if you use the standard image to verify your printer when you first set it up, sounds like a broken record, right? All the time I say this, those three things create that trifecta, that perfect triangle. And so that is the most accurate way. If you are interested in reproducing what you see on paper as accurately as it actually existed, that's one way of doing it. And why would you do that? If you're reproducing art, okay? If I'm shooting landscape, I don't care. I really don't care. I'm going to probably enhance and change some of those greens, some of those blues, some of those reds and yellows that I see. I'm going to probably edit them a different, you know, increase the intensity and so forth. But if I'm reproducing someone's piece of art that they drew, they painted, they did whatever, and I'm using a camera system and I'm lighting that so evenly as to be perfect and I photograph it. I want my sensor to reproduce every single nuance of that person's painting so that I can then, at the very end of the whole process, create paper prints that can be then sold as a limited edition. And when you put them next to the original, oh my gosh, they match. They match the original painting, drawing, watercolor, whatever. So 
That's the only way to achieve that. The only way. There's no other way to do this. Another thing that you do, a lot of these companies that reproduce art, they may not use the X-ray color checker, but they have their own systems. On, their, on the wall, on the mount where they actually put the art, they have lots of color patches. Lots of color patches of known value. And they shoot that, and then they correct. They have ways. Believe me, they have software that will then take that file and correct any errors that were introduced by the sensor, the camera sensor. That would happen with film too. Film reproduced colors inaccurately. And certain films have certain profiles of how they reproduce colors. And now some of these softwares, you can actually load these LUTs, what they call a lookout table, onto your image to give it the look of quarter color two from 1967, you know, and you realize how, well, in a way, how bad color was reproduced back in those days, okay, compared to, you know, up-to-date digital systems that we have now. Crazy. Anyway, so remember, you can calibrate your camera, well, kind of create a profile for your camera and less combination and the lighting condition that you shoot at if you really want to get super picky about accurate color. One more thing that I would say would be that we would need accurate color for. You're shooting a wedding and the guys don't care. They're wearing black tuxedos or suits or whatever. They could care less. But the girls' lavender, you know, dresses, that's a tough color for a sensor to, to reproduce correctly. It will not be translated that way on your image. It will be another shade of color. And if you try to change that globally, you will affect everything else as well. Now, Photoshop allows you to, to adjust certain colors individually or separately from everything else. Lightroom gives you that option too. But why bother? If you just begin your shoot by taking a close-up of that color checker card, then whatever errors the sensor would have introduced will be recorded with that particular test image. And then you make the correction and you apply that profile to all the other images. And all of a sudden, those dresses will look accurate because you know what will happen when you, when you turn in that set of photographs to your bride? Not the groom won't care. The bride will. The bride's mother will definitely care. Oh, you didn't get the color right on those dresses. Yeah. And you know what? The skin tones are perfect. Everything else is... But OMG, the color of the dresses is off. They're not sky blue. They're not lavender. They're not purple. Who the heck would wear purple? You know, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. And so... You need to come up with a way to really eliminate as much as you can any kind of errors beyond your control. And the sensor is beyond your control. So luckily for us, we have a way to even get rid of that problem. So I would suggest highly that when you get your i1 studio, you put that passport card to work on your, you know, very uh, important photo shoots. Okay. I know you guys, are, some of you do studio work. And so I know women, uh, Art of Women Photography from Australia, he is constantly shooting the most gorgeous women in the world, in Australia. You need something to very, very accurately depict. If you're doing commercial photography and you got logos, certain color that you need to reproduce, super accurate, you need to use this. You cannot rely on Photoshop to help you later or Lightroom to help you later. You have to, right out of the camera, you have to correct that file. Do a, a, a global correction of that whole shoot. As long as the conditions did not change, then that shot that you took of the passport card then can be used to generate a profile, which can then be applied to that whole batch of images. And I'm telling you, you your jaw drops when you see the, the correction taking place on the fly as you apply that. I've done it. I did it in Disney World. My kids were out there and you know they were wearing bright shirts and my camera just did not record those colors accurately. I took some shots of some barbershop quartet groups in the streets 
And when I apply that correction filter, bam, it's like magic. All of a sudden, the neon shirt looks neon. Now, can the printer, you know, reproduce that neon look? Maybe yes, maybe no. But if you see it in your monitor and it's not out of gamut, and your monitor calibrator and your printer certified, then you should be very close to those results. You should be very close. But you know, if you if you miss one of those trifecta pieces of that triangle, then you kind of are, are not really uh, reaching that that I would call it photo printing nirvana. That's what you know. The whole goal is to reach that point. Oh my goodness. Um, Rafael Zaga, $20 Super Chat. Thank you so much, man. And you're a new guy here? That's amazing. Thank you. Appreciate that so much. Yeah, that'll help this month, I'm telling you. It's so dismal. But I appreciate that. If you have any questions, Rafael, let me know, man. Ask, ask right now, because right now you have priority over the whole group. That's definitely the way it works. All right, let's see what else we got here. Big thanks to all. Almost ready to start. Wish me luck. Oh, looks like somebody just got a printer. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I'm trying to see what he got. Oh, Pro 100S. So he must be outside the U.S. because I think that's a European version of the Pro 100. Hey, the adventure begins. Yes, sir. I just dusted off my very old Huey calibrator. Oh goodness. Uh, you can't rely with that on, on that any longer. Um, you need to move up to something more modern. The Huey calibrator was a little puck that you attached to your monitor and it was very, very, um, limited in what it could do. The, uh, I want studio is actually really good in the, this one's is just an animal right here. The calibration that it does for your monitor is just so much better. It's using so many different um, color um, column patches. Basically, it loads up the whole screen with many shades of different uh, colors, densities. So you end up then with a very, very linear, neutrally linear uh, R, G, and B from black all the way to white and every shade in between and every mixture between any of those combinations of color of RGB. And you end up with a monitor that's even a cheap monitor like this. This is originally $500, about probably eight, nine years old already, and it's still, you know, working perfectly, knock on wood. I hope it doesn't die on me tomorrow. Um, but yeah, it's even on a monitor that's really uh, lacking in a way because it's not a super high-end monitor. But I can get some beautiful displays of images. And again, if you guys were you're looking at my my uh, view of the desktop, you guys are the judge of this. If you see uh, any kind of off color result, and I'm telling you, I guarantee you, right now I am seeing perfect rendition. And when I do the screen grab, the screen view, if I show you the screen view, this is not going through the camera. This is directly from the screen, meaning through the graphic card screen and into the software and out to you guys. So these shades right here, this is this is neutral. This is a neutral gray. So if this has any kind of um, tint to it, then you guys will know that you know it's your your end. It's your display uh, situation that's a little off. I should be able to have whoa wrong one. I should be able to have neutral rendition here as I look at it and when you are looking at my little broadcast version you should also see it as neutral it should be the same if we could all be calibrated if all monitors could be calibrated to a world standard then we wouldn't have to deal with this we would not have to deal with this because out of the box everyone would be perfect that way imagine if I edit something and then I send it to you and you say, well, wait a minute, Joe, this is a little cyan. What? No, it can't be. I, I, you know, edited it on my calibrated monitor. Yeah. So you will have differences. People, people always say, well, I have to, I have to create uh, two profiles, one to send 
images to the web because other people are not going to have a calibrator monitor. Yeah, boy, yeah, that's true. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. People are not going to be calibrated to the level that you are. If you're really serious about it, like me, I know that if I create an image here, at least I know it's neutral because when I load my standard image untempered, it's perfect. It looks perfect on my monitor. So that way I know that if I edit one of my images so that it looks the way I want it, unless your monitor is also calibrated to the extent mine is, you're going to probably see it slightly different. Okay. And that's going to make you think that, oh, Joe didn't edit this right. You know, so that's going to be the case. We have to always be at a certain standard. And by standard, I mean like a, a constant. It has to be a constant. I love these uh, little catchy titles. Amazing printer after all these years. Okay, let's see what we are talking about. Uh, they're talking about a after hundreds of 16 by 24 prints and numerous refills. The printer still prints flawlessly. That's a 3880. Well, I cannot disagree. I cannot disagree with that. Great printer. All right, let's jump. Let's jump over to to um, Facebook. I want to show you guys where we are at. We are really doing well. So I'm here in the corner today. Uh, take a look over here, guys and gals. 1931. So we got a ton of members here. And again, the more people we get, the more views we get. By that mean, more viewpoints from people. Different users have different ways of thinking. This guy right here has been producing some really fantastic work. Really, really good, good work. And he did, this is a little collage. I guess he did it on, uh, it's a little misaligned right now, but look at that. That's really cool. It's a little bit not so easy to do. I was going to do this with sublimation. So, uh, maybe do, uh, you know, like four 11 by 14s. So I ended up with a, I ended up with a uh, 22 by 20 by 28 print composed of four panels. And what normal people will do normally, what they'll do is they'll leave a gap. So they have to actually, you know, optically uh, create a gap between the two. Otherwise, you have to kind of butt them together and that kind of loses the illusion of four panels floating on the wall. You guys are really doing great work. It just, just blows my mind when I thought, you know, oh, why am I doing this? Oh, look at this. Holy cannoli. When printing black and white on a Pro 1000, do you let the driver control color? No, somebody said. No, in color management, set to none. Yeah, here's two ways to print black and white. Okay. You can see me down here, right in the corner here. Two ways to print black and white. Either let the printer control color and then choose black and white mode, Pro 1000, or advanced black and white in the Epson printers. You get fabulous results either way. Or just simply convert your, your image to black and white, keep it in RGB, and run it as if you were printing a color image. You'll still get perfectly linear black and white results. Okay. The theory behind advanced black and white or black and white mode on Canon printers is that the printer will tend to use mostly your black and gray inks and will then introduce bits of yellow magenta in order to neutralize areas that need to be neutralized something that may be printing a little bit warm will be cooled down by adding a little cyan maybe you know and so forth but it's going to use mostly your your so-called monochrome inks i can print full rgb from images that i convert to black and white and they come out perfectly neutral and perfectly linear. I mean, you, you can scrutinize them and look all you want, and you will not find any areas that appear to be, you know, where some change of hue is taking place. Hardly ever happens. Look what's there. Oh, my God. This has nothing to do with this question, but I, 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 I moved down. Stephen, 
no no Otarski. I finally got the masterpiece framed. It will be hanging on my office wall. Thanks again, Jose. Wow. I don't even remember uh, this guy buying one of these prints. <laughs> but anyway, there you go. So that is my... Um, do I have one here? I do. I happen to have one here. These are my display prints, not the ones that I sell. I'm giving some of these away to some of uh, my wife's friends that love um, Annapolis. Here it is. Let me put it. Let me go over to the desk from let desktop view to me. Here is the print. So yeah, that looks fantastic, man. I'm glad you did that. I'm going to look for a couple of frames for me to display this with as well. Because that's one print that I just love. I have a huge one over there. Um, probably a 17 by 24 size that I would love to uh, get framed. Of course, I don't know where the heck I would I would put it. But I'm sure I could find a place to put it. I might give it to uh, maybe the in-laws. They have plenty of wall space. And my daughter would probably enjoy it as well. So the problem is that I would rather buy just a pre-made you know, frame than spend hundreds of dollars on a, on a frame. And some of these people have done that from what I hear. And it's really um, it impresses the heck out of me because I didn't think it was worthy of that kind of uh, treatment. But apparently other people tend to think so. Anyway, these are being put on sale again, like I said before, 20 bucks each, including shipping to the US. We're talking about printing what ICC profile paper manufacturers tell you what oh here's a good question. This is good. This is this will spark a really good discussion, I'm sure. And I'm sure a lot of people wonder about this as well. And though I have spoken about it prior to this people still need to, be, need to be reminded of the reason for this so i'm going to just read it and then i'm going to switch over to me and, and we'll talk about this when printing with an icc profile the paper manufacturer tells you what media time type to use but why i know it is to get correct color and so on but what happens if you use the wrong media type, I thought that ICC profiles told the printer how to print on any given media. And the answer is no. ICC profiles are specific to the paper. Why is that? Give me about five seconds here while I switch over and I pull up those very charts that I showed you earlier. Let me move over. Move the stuff over and we'll take these out. Now we have a set of three of these actually. So we have three of these charts. This is printed on Epson Hot Press Bright. Okay. So let me show you. This paper is a matte surface paper. It is a cold, very white back background on the paper base. So the coating over the background. It's a very cold white and it is hot press, meaning that the paper was coated and then passed through rollers to have a heated surface. And so this, the, when that happens, you create a very smooth surface. Okay. So those are basically three different parameters there. And then the paper has a certain thickness. You can see I'm holding it here by the edge and it's not flexing hardly at all. Watch this. Not very much flex. Has a certain thickness. So, you create a profile. In the driver, you have to choose, when you print those charts, when you print those charts, you have to use whatever the paper recommendation is. Because you got to look at it this way. When you buy, say, Red River paper, you don't have to use their profiles. They can tell you, okay, if you buy uh, Polar Luster, then use Epson, you know, Pro Luster paper 
paper choice. You will get close enough results. You will get, you know, relatively close results, especially images where colors can be a little bit off and you won't tell. You, you don't care because it's, it's a landscape or a seascape or whatever. And so you don't care. But when you're dealing with skin tones, my beautiful skin tones, right? Then you might care. So they will tell you use this paper type. It has a similar thickness, similar surface. It should be react similarly. So what they do is when they print those charts, they will use that paper that best matches the characteristic, physical characteristics of that paper. Okay. So if I'm using the Epson, what was it? Hot press bright. Well, there's an actual choice for hot press bright. But what if I was using a similar third party brand? Well, if it looks like hot press bright, they will probably use that paper choice to create those profiles by that simple act of using that paper choice to create those profile charts. Then the profile that's created for you, when you use that particular paper from that particular third party choice company, you will have to print using that same paper choice that they used when they created those charts with. Okay. So that will then enter the physical needs of that paper to the driver. How much ink does it take? Ink density. Okay. Some papers vary in how much ink density they, they need to create a specific shade of a specific color. How thick the paper is that will set the paper, the paper to print head distance. Okay. Uh, if it's a stiff paper, did you have to use the manual feeder? Okay. Um, surface. Will it be a glossy paper? Will it be a matte paper? Do you need matte black ink? Do you need photo black ink? And so forth. So that's why you have to do that. You have to do that every single time so that the profile that's created simply, all it does is tells the printer how to create color accurately has nothing to do with paper thickness, nothing to do with the use of black matte or, or, or photo black, matte black or photo black. Yeah, I said that right. Or any of those physical parameters. It has nothing to do with, um, whether it is, you know, flexible or not flexible. You can have a thick paper that's very flexible. You can get by by feeding that to the regular feeder. You can have some, Paper that's extremely stiff. You will have to feed it to the straighter path. In some cases, you have to use the actual straight path of the printer in order to be able to print. So those are physical parameters and those are controlled by the paper choice. Paper choice has nothing to do with color reproduction. The profile handles that. Okay. The profile handles how the printer will mix those eight colors, nine colors, 12 colors, six colors, whatever to give you as close a rendition of the image that you're sending to it. That's it. Now, Mike Cheney provided the answer in a very eloquent and correct way. Let me see if I can find it. I saw it earlier today and I thought, oh, I need to bring this up tonight. Lots of people jumped in, but I want to find Mike Cheney's answer here. Here we go. He says, an ICC profile cannot contain any form of the driver settings. Okay. It only contains translation of one set of RGB values, your image, to another, your printer. The paper type selection in the driver sets up the inks and ink density. I said that, right? So when he says sets up the inks, he means either, either black, matte black ink or photo black. To be used on that paper, the ICC profile does nothing more than tell the printer what colors are actually printed for those inks and densities. Think of your driver settings as loading a particular region of a map and the ICC profile is your GPS planning the route. Your paper type selection loads the map and the GPS assumes the proper map is loaded so that it can then run turn left here, go right here, go two miles that way, and so forth and so forth. So yeah, basically that's it. The paper choice handles the physical aspects, 
you know, of the of the job. Thickness, surface, type of paper, and so forth. And the ICC profile does nothing that nothing other than control color. So a shade of pink will be reproduced correctly on that particular paper because you also chose the correct paper type to print it. Okay. If you choose another paper type, the ink density will change, you see, because that paper may need more ink density. Okay. A glossy paper doesn't need as much ink density. In other words, as much ink. A matte paper does require more ink density. So, you know, that, that sort of thing. So that's what the profile does. And that's what the paper choices do. But when you create a profile, you kind of have to link the two together. Yeah. And unfortunately, you have to kind of choose the best closest paper choice for this job. But once you print those patches on that particular paper with that particular best match or closest match paper choice, and that is scanned and that profile is created, it's fine. That'll be the most perfect way to let the printer reproduce an image on that paper that was profiled as correctly as you see it on your calibrator monitor. If your monitor is not calibrated, it's not going to work. So you need to have a monitor calibrated. Simple as that. All right. So that was really an uh, interesting way to do that, um, to, to actually discuss that. I had a question on my, on my um, YouTube comments. Here we go. Um, someone asked, can you use Epson's own ink from their new eco, I mean, they mean the eco tank system, for example, black, yellow, cyan, and magenta to refill the OEM cartridges for a 3800? Well, technically, yes, you can, but it will really be a, be a dumb idea. I mean, I know you're trying to save money. And by the, uh, yeah, anyway, let's not get any further than that. So I, I wanted to talk about the person who provided the question, but that's not nice. So you're talking about very cheap dye inks, first of all, and then a very good pigment ink printer. Why would you want to do that? Why? You know, just to save a few bucks? No, 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 no. Besides, of course, it'll work. Nothing bad will happen. But boy, you will you need some uh, extensive re, you know profiling of all your papers to get good results because those inks are really not that good. They're really not meant for any kind of accurate photo printing. It's really for document printing. It's really for non-important type printing that you're going to do high volumes of. That's why they provide you with this eco tank, economy tanks, ecology tanks. I guess they call them too, so that you can print you know, 1,500 pieces of, you know, document in just one tank of uh, ink. I mean, a lot. You print a lot, but it's not for, like, high-end printers. So why would you choose that cheap ink and put it in a 3,800? Not a good idea. So that was a good one that I saw today. Someone um, bought a printer, didn't say what kind, six years old. And right there, I, I saw this on my phone earlier today. I was outside petting that stray kitty that visits me every day. She's getting more amorous lately. Climbs on my lap and lets me kiss her and all of that. Again, I'm waiting for her to snarl at me and bite half my face off, but she's not doing that. Today, she gave me a little, a little tap because she saw someone, the neighbor walking by, and she got scared. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> besides the point, uh, yeah, that's what I do with my spare time. So, six-year-old printer, right there, I said, oh, my God, are you kidding me? You know, why would you buy a six-year-old printer? But it was brand new in box, sealed. I decided to use the OEM cartridges that came with the printer just to see if the colors are bad. Well, there's no way you're really going to see if the colors are bad. Will this kill the print hit? Or should I just buy new cartridges and push the old ink out? So I assume it's already set up, and now he's terrified. Well, since he didn't say whether it is a, a 
pigment ink printer, what kind of printer it is, whether it's a dye ink printer. I told them to agitate the, the cartridges, take them out right now and agitate them and put them back in and hope for the best. No need to worry about. Um, six years is nothing for, I buy cartridges for ink for me to harvest from that are older than that. So, and again, originally sealed, really nothing really breaks down. It's not, there's nothing really organic in there that will break down with age. Um, you can contaminate the inks. Yeah. By bad, really unclean techniques when you refill, but and of course, it's always best to buy the newest um, inks and nothing that's, you know, going to be 10 years old or something like that. But technically speaking, they will work. I've proven that numerous times. I'm still doing it and still having no problems whatsoever with my 3880, 3800, 2880, R3000. I'm doing that with all of those printers. And so far, nothing, you know, bad has occurred. So I can only assume that it really has no bearing. Now, dye inks, that's another story. You don't want to do that with dye inks. All righty. Oh, the question about cleaning cycles just, just keeps coming up and up and up and up. Uh, somebody had a B400 error with a Canon Pro 100 and wanted to know what that is. I said, you know what? No idea, my friend, that you Google it and see what it's all about. He says, I did. No good answer. I worked my way through this once before, and I'm having no luck now. When I open the ink print head door, the print heads are not moving into view. Oh, then that's a mechanical problem. I see what you're talking about. I, I, you know, <coughs> it might be a, yeah, the Pro 100, when you open the lid, Printed is supposed to automatically move to the center. That's that's one that does that. The Pro 10 does not do that automatically. You have to press the uh, button to make it do that. And of course, the Pro 1, no, you can't. You know, it doesn't let you mess around with the printer unless you have a special uh, procedure, which I can provide anyone who has a need for that with that correct procedure to get away with doing that. But no, so if the print hit carriage assembly is not moving on its own toward the center uh, that's something beyond me and that is uh, an error that needs to be addressed by a technician and uh, you can't just solve that by uh, turning off the printer and back on again people keep asking me about XP 410 and XP this. I don't deal with those printers. Those are, those are the, the, you know, 13 inch, um, I mean, the eight and a half inch printers. And I just don't deal with any of those printers. I work only with 13 inch and above. So please remember that when you guys ask questions, because again, I think I told you guys at one time what printers I do work with Pro 1000, Pro 1, Pro 10, Pro 100. P800, R3000, 3880, 3800, and R2000, 2880, um, 1900, 1400, nothing in the little tabletop, you know, all in one type uh, deal. I, I just don't have a need for any of that because there's so many different variations of all of these printers. And again, not even workforce units. I have an old workforce 1100 before they changed the look. The old workforces don't look anything like the new workforce printers. So I just don't have the room. You don't want to look at my room right now. It's just a gigantic clutter. Uh, so do I need to add more? No, I don't need to add any more. I need to get rid of some of the printers and then replace them with anything that might be popping out new this year. Who knows? Who knows what the uh, future brings? And so I, I can't be bringing in all of these random printers just to satisfy the need of a few people out there. I can't do that. There's no way that I can afford to do that, nor do I have the room to be able to house that many printers. Um, talking about the last uh, video that I did about waste ink pads, how can you tell? When are my waste ink pads going to go full? Uh, I say, well, it could be a year and a half. It could be more than six, seven years. It doesn't really uh, matter, uh, actually, because... No one really knows. 
It all boils down to how often you generate waste ink. And Pro 100, I got mine on uh, 13 uh, August, you know, year 2013, August, set it up immediately. And right now is uh, what? <laughs> 2019, January. And still no warning whatsoever. So what can I tell you? It can be, if you generate a ton of waste ink, by improper practices, if you will, if you disable your ink monitoring, trying to cheat your way through chip resetting, so you don't have to buy a resetter, you can disable ink monitoring. Every print you make will be preceded by a cleaning cycle. Every time you turn the printer on, it will be preceded by a cleaning cycle. You will waste a bunch of ink. Sure, you're using cheap inks, refilling your cartridges, but that will fill up your waste ink tech. Ink past maybe in a year and a half to two years instead of in my case almost six years now not a problem so it depends on your use and the way you use your printer this guy has a an r3 r2000 which is the new version of the 1900 and the one that precedes the new p400 they all use eight colors one of them is chroma optimizer no gloss optimizer again the same reason behind this is to apply a, a gloss coat over your prints and he's had it now for about four and a half years regular use i bought the adjustment program from me and after extracting the files i ran it and it reset everything so now what it needs to do is to modify that printer so you no longer are pouring waste ink into this internal pass that were declared already saturated by the waste ink counter now you have to divert that it's like diverting a river a creek you have to now bring that fluid outside so you can catch it in a bottle and once you do that and you you know spend a couple of months collecting that you'll be sick when you see how much ink is actually being generated and uh, all of that was being dumped internally so that's why if you have an epson printer you have no excuse whatsoever especially an epson photo printer no excuse whatsoever not to have converted that printer to external ink catching early early not after it's declared you know saturated that's too late but do it early that way you begin to, uh, you know, save those internal paths. In case you have to revert back to a, you know, full OEM condition, you still have clean pads, okay? Because remember, you can reset those counters back to zero and start all over again, over and over and over, as long as you're collecting the ink outside and not internally. If you soil those pads, normally you would have to take that printer in for servicing, and it's just too much. And he says, it, you know, your tips on how to make an ink recovery system are good too. To replace the printer would cost me over $500. So the adjustment program for 15 bucks, which really includes the custom video that I made and all kinds of extra help files that I include in it, you know, it's, it's more than worth it. All I, and I like, buying low-cost real epson inks for forty dollars a set yes see i may have talked about this okay but here's the deal that printer the r2000 is a wonderful dtg printer direct to garment printer but in order to print direct to garment in some cases if you're going to print on a darker shirt like this something even maybe black you need to have one of those channels dedicated to white ink and that ink kills print heads okay so they go through a lot of R2000. They convert it very easily to uh, to uh, DTG uh, work. And so they cannot use the original inks. Those are only meant for photo. They cannot be printed on fabric. So they sell them. They sell them off. They buy hundreds of R2000s, hundreds of them. And then they sell that the, those ink sets. And I've gotten them as low as $8 each for a set of OEM normally 90 something dollars maybe maybe more and so yeah you can still get them you can still get them this is, this is a very popular printer still for the dtg industry so i'm glad that he's having a good luck with that 
And uh, let's see. Uh, oh, one of the prints that I used that I got from uh, one of the images that I go used that I got from the uh, challenge section of DP Review, the actual photographer showed up and I thought he was going to yell at me for using his uh, image. But I offered to uh, send it to him. I did locate it. And I said, just give me your address and I'll send it to you. He wanted to know if I, if I, if I could sell it, I could send him a few bucks. I don't know what kind of tone he wrote that in, but, you know, I did add, uh, re, re, uh, contact him and told him to send me, uh, your address and I would be glad to mail it to him because it is a beautiful print that I made. Uh, the point was to take a very, a relatively low resolution image because when you load them, as a challenge, they have these challenges where people have to produce a certain theme photograph and then they upload them and every week they have a little contest. So, you know, they're not going to be very high resolution, maybe a thousand by two thousand uh, or less, you know, maybe a thousand by fifteen hundred pixels. And I made a big ass print and I made it in QImage because QImage uprising algorithm is just superior. So it turned out really nice. And I used it on a video, so he saw it. So I thought he was going to yell at me or sue me or whatever. But um, again, I don't think that's going to be the case. So um, he just basically told me the uh, camera that he took it with. And um, I did, uh, I said, I only I only use awesome images like yours to use as example for perfect images for printing. So I thought that image was edited beautifully. And I didn't change it one iota when I printed it. And basically, I was uh, demonstrating the power of QImage Ultimate. I told him I would never sell them. Send me your address, and I will be glad to send it to you. And I'm waiting. So far, no, no response. <laughs> Someone is selling, letting their Pro 10 sit in a box while I read, watch, learn more and more and wait till I know I am ready to fire that puppy up and commit. I may even write some batch scripts that would get some appropriate settings for color management. That's interesting. You know, that that, that would be interesting. I asked Dolly, actually told him that that was awesome and to please share any work that he does of that type. All right, before I show you the... Uh, the last bit that I'm going to discuss. Let me go finish up with the chat here. After that super chat from Raphael, he just sent me, he just told me, uh, he's thanking me for helping us, the group, the community, understand our printers. We'll touch base by email as per your request on your one. 0101 screencast. I don't remember what we were talking about then. You have to refresh my memory, Raphael. Spy 597. Jose, is your, if your monitor dies, invest on a 43 inch 4K TV. Yeah, I've heard that. And that's what my son is just recently did. He bought a gaming computer and set it up with a regular TV. As long as it's got an HDMI cable, he gets beautiful results. Yeah, I know. You can purchase. I, I, if I go to the Naval Exchange, which is, you know, for the Navy, I'm able to go in there. You can get some incredible bargains in there. So that's maybe what I will do. That's maybe what I will do. <clears throat> Eagle, 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 are, uh, my eyes are so foggy right now. Arandotir. A pro printer once told me to print black and white in color. Yes, that's what I do all the time. There's really no need. Um, there are some um, systems that you can set up a dedicated printer for just black inks. In other words, different shades of black ink. And you use a, a RIP program to be able to print. You, you basically are investing a bunch of money just to print black and white. When in reality, just printing your converted... RGB base black and white images using just your regular color managed workflow works beautifully beautifully no need to go that route although they claim that the results are better but again you have to show me that to believe make me believe that Andrew Simpson is from saying hello from Scotland 
Gee, buddy, I hope you didn't just walk in now. We have 43 people. We've been going a little bit downhill since we started here. Let me see what we got. Yeah. So we're 43 right now. That's good. That's good. All right. Your audio and video are out of sync. Yeah, I kind of thought that. I kind of thought that. But too late to fix that now. I got to go back and fix that on uh, that stupid OBS software. It is really a pain. Um, I did have that fixed for a while and uh it seems to just reset itself for no reason whatsoever so i gotta fix that thanks for bringing that up yeah and somebody in canada also said that let me show you guys how you go about doing that so i'm going to put that here I'm going to go to desktop view and here we go so watch me or you can watch me here so you see that very bad so that's a really bad lag so what you do is you have to go here that's the camera and let me see I forget where I did that actually no I think it's here advance and video capture sync offset yes so we'll do 300 300 milliseconds we'll see what happens nope just as bad so what i'm going to do is i'm going to work on this later this is really horrible Let's jump over to the monitor because this is going to be very, very bad. And I will fix this uh, for the next one, I'm sure. I don't know how this happened. I didn't even notice. Once I got my camera set up correctly to be able to uh, be seen here, I guess they threw things way out of um, sync. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, I will this. I'll, I'll deal with this later. <clears throat> no, I don't want to shut that down. It will close the uh, live stream. Let's jump over to the full to the full desktop because I want to leave you guys with this. So, my wife and I wanted to know um, our ancestry. So we joined ancestry.com. We had a good sale for Christmas. She did hers, and she got very, very um, uh, in interesting information she wasn't aware of. But look at me. So here I thought I was a, a large percentage Spanish from Spain. That is not the case. My background seems to come from Portugal. 40% Portuguese, 13% Italian, 12% Spain. 12% France and 23% other regions. We really don't know what the other regions are. Let's click here and see what happens. So this is going to be... I have not looked at this yet, so um, this will be for you guys to also experience. All right, so 40% Portuguese, apparently. We'll close on all this distracting, distracting stuff. Now, <laughs> I'm 13% Italian, 12% Span Spanish. So here I thought it was going to be like 80% Spanish, maybe some Middle Eastern, because a lot of people from Spain come from the Middle East originally. Native American, I got 5%. European Jewish, 5%. Cameroon, Congo, Southern Bantu people, 3%. Got a little color in me, Ireland. Scotland, 3%, Native American, and Andean. Andean. So that is probably um, down here. Mali, are you kidding me? Norway, Sardinia, Northern Africa. 
And these are my, the, my people migrated to Puerto Rico from your regions, Native American. Let's see what it says here. So here's where, where my family is from. Okay. My mother, my mother is from here. My father is from here. I was born in San Juan. So there you go. I'm Portuguese, people. I did not know that. <laughs> there you go. So pretty awesome, right? So rather than switch back to my out of sync voice, I'm going to go ahead and say good night to everybody and thank you for joining us tonight. All of the support that you guys give the channel. Keep it up, folks. That's the only way that I can continue to do this. So thank you once again. <laughs> yeah, my people come from everywhere. That's really strange, right? So, yeah, <laughs> that is something that I am, I wasn't ready for at all. I thought it was going to be quite boring, but it turns out to be quite exciting. And I got to share that with my sister because she has no clue about, you know, and again, also my cousins, we have certain uh, beliefs of what our backgrounds were, and this is going to really open up a can of worms, I guess, with the family. <laughs> I'm excited about it. I'm, I actually think it's hilarious. All right, so thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and like, and we'll see you next week. Maybe we'll see you on a surprise uh, impromptu live stream. I don't know yet. If I come up with something exciting that I have to immediately share with everyone, that's going to be the case. So thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody.